Bring your chair up there. And before you get going, I, I should just clarify um, some questions we had from, from the audience before. Uh, at, at this this particular meeting is a committee of the whole meeting, uh, and so um, the discussion is essentially around this table, uh, and at this stage, uh, not an opportunity for, for um, folks to ask, ask questions at this time. Uh, obviously, we are more than happy to answer questions uh, off, offline, uh, and then when it does come um, back to uh, a council meeting on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month, we'll figure out the schedule. That's when there was an opportunity there to uh, register for the open forum and, and either um, uh, ask comments or questions or say, um, say any comments that you have at that time. So today, um, I appreciate you all being here. Um, obviously, uh, a strong support in, in the crowd here for this topic. So. Um, thanks for being here, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully our discussion uh, goes smoothly today. So, um, Kim, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to uh, kind of introduce um, Clemens, and we'll, we'll get going. So moved. Yeah, I don't think we modified it, but good enough. So, um, and state the vote. Are they, um, call the vote on that. Thank you. All right, okay. now we can go. So most of you know me, so I'm Kim Winston, FCSS Director, and I'm here today with Clemens from Grant Thornton. Um, the reason that we're here today is to discuss and provide the findings to you all on the Child Care Services Review. This is the phase two of the report. Um, I'm not going to go through this document. I think we want to hear from Clemens about the recommendations, have some discussion about those recommendations, so I'll let you take it away, Clemens. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be back in Beaumont, especially on a beautiful day like this. So uh, instead of creating a formal slide deck and all the rest of it, I thought uh, I reread the summary a few days ago. This is the first sort of three or four paragraphs of this document. I would wrap a bit of a framework around it, then actually just read that section because I think uh, in about 30 or so lines, it captures what I believe is the heart of our recommendation. And then I would like to leave as much time as possible for, uh, for a clarifying discussion. So the, uh, the, the context I want to put this in, first of all, is, is, is just an acknowledgement or a reminder that this is a discussion draft. So it's still very much uh, written in water. There's still a lot of opportunity for further conversation of which uh, this evening's conversation is the first part. And then I understand there's uh, some ideas around some, some ways forward that continue to be collaborative and I think that's extremely important. Uh, even within the original brief, there were still uh, two steps after this anyways. The, the, the next one after this would have been, after feedback from council would have been the drafting of a final report and then uh, as, as a major section of that, a, a new section which would actually be a full-blown implementation plan with some ideas around uh, further information to gather, new ways to look at and engage with your stakeholders, and uh, some of the possible risks and costs explored more deeply than they are here. So with that said, let me launch into the, uh, the actual document itself. So, I'm going to go straight to the recommendation piece because most of us understand the context already. The section after the recommendation piece, this is on page 24 for those of you who have the document in front of you. Uh, just, Sorry, just to clarify, your page 24? Yes. yes. So. It's the one that's got the, the, the head of recommendation at the very so 46 top. 46 of 59 46. for everyone else following on. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Good? Good. Excellent. So it's our recommendation that the City of Beaumont consider a two-phase approach to the future of child care. The first phase would be to maintain current municipal child care services while developing opportunities for expansion with partners to achieve a target of universal availability for child care services in Beaumont. Phase one would be complete when, through a centrally facilitated network of services, every family that requires child care for children ages zero to five would find a place in Beaumont. Phase two, on achieving universal availability, the city would transition from its role of being a direct provider of childcare services to being the facilitator of those services through central coordination and a level of financial support. Our recommendation is based on four factors. The first is the shortage of childcare services, childcare spaces in Beaumont, 
nothing unusual or, or unique to this community. There are a shortage of childcare spaces across the Western world, as far as I'm aware. The second is the economic benefit to a community of early childcare. That's well documented in the academic literature, in, in national literature, around any sort of social and economic development issues that the availability of childcare plays a significant role in the financial and social well-being of a community. Number three, the expertise and credibility the City of Beaumont already has in the management and delivery of child care services. So this was a resource and an asset and a history that we did not want to see go by the wayside as the city moved forward. And finally, the alignment, as we understand it, with the 2017-2021 Municipal Strategic Plan, particularly the areas of economic innovation and innovation in support of our quality of life. The goal of this recommendation is to realize the distinction of achieving universal availability of early child care while ultimately withdrawing from the direct delivery of that service. We believe the City of Beaumont is uniquely positioned to achieve what is a goal almost every community, for almost every community in Canada. Quality, affordable early child care available to all residents who require it. And that contributes to the economy and the social well-being of that community. We support the position that improving the educational and social outcomes for children generates long-term benefits for community and its economy. Our recommendation links a capacity building phase in partnership with other partners to the ultimate exit of the city from the direct delivery of child care services. We rest the merit of this recommendation on three factors. One, Municipalities are not traditionally primary deliverers of education or child care services in Canada. Where government does get involved in the direct delivery of social and educational programs like this, it is usually at the provincial level. Two, it establishes as an ambitious objective the provision of child care services to all resident families who need it. It proposes accomplishing this worthwhile goal by positioning the city and its resources as a facilitator and coordinator, even financial contributor, but not as a direct service provider. And number three, it is consistent with one of the four options council requested we look at most closely, that being exit with partners. So I'll leave it at that and look to you for questions. Do you have anything to add, Ms. Wilson? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the, the brief presentation, appreciate that. Um, before we get into this uh, around around the table here, um, CAO Schwartz, I wonder if you could just clarify um, uh, for for us around the table, what exactly is the expectations from administration uh, of an outcome for for today's meeting here? Um, we've got a we provided the the kind of two page report here up front. Um, I just want you to clarify exactly what you're looking for from us today. Sure. Uh, if we go back to the uh, request for direction, there's a proposed next steps. It goes back to what Clint has just explained to us. One is we want to provide this information, this draft uh, report to uh, council and get any feedback that we want to provide. Is there more information you're looking for, comments you want to make? We'd like to ultimately confirm a direction that the council wishes to take, uh, whether that be fleshing out the uh, recommendation from Grant Thornton or whether it be something else or a combination thereof. Uh, we'll then provide that direction back to Graham Thornton. If it is to choose one of those options, the next step would be to develop a detailed transition plan, which would then come back uh, to council. Regardless, the final report will come back to a regular council meeting for an ultimate decision. As you said earlier, this is about discussing, understanding, and determining what other information we need for council to make a decision. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so from a, a process perspective, how we're going to manage this discussion, uh, we'll open it up for questions of, from Council. Uh, and once we've kind of exhausted our questions um, of, uh, of Clemens here and, and potentially administration, then we'll go around and, and ask for folks to, to weigh in on, on their thoughts on um, uh, a very well-documented read. So thank you for all the effort to put this in. Um, and, and also thank you to everyone who participated in, in the study to provide all the data and the, the background information. Certainly a very good read and um, something that um, is a, uh, a great document for us to, to launch into our next phase here. So I'm going to open it up for, for general questions here um, before we get into some, some comments from folks. So um, who's got some questions? We'll start with me. I got a few. 
Um, no, I appreciate I appreciate all the work that's gone into this, and uh, um, it's a really good read. And but but I do I, I do have a few questions, and do you want me to answer no, one or two? Or let, let's keep going until yeah, we just find them. Go the okay, so I'm on page twenty six to fifty nine of the package. Um, question surrounding quality of delivery. Um, an interesting comment was made. Um, one outlier. Very last sentence, the one outlier was I feel that the program fees are appropriate in relation to the quality of program my family is receiving. 73% uh, of parents agreed with this statement. Agreed with this statement. Was that that they felt they were getting, they were over, that, that the other people were overpaying or felt that they, these people felt that they were underpaying for the, like put, put, put that in context for me. Do you know what page that would be? Page four of your report. Oh, sorry. Page four. I'll, I'll do both. Page four. Page four, pardon. So this would have been in summary of the uh, original report. Yes. Of the quality of the delivery of the hospital. Oh yes, there we go. <clears throat> this was pointed out the initial in in the uh, the phase one report as as an interesting outlier uh, in the overall extremely high levels of satisfaction that we understood mm -hmm. that came back from that survey, which is not a survey that we administer, it was a previous one, uh, in which as, as the paragraph states there, most of the responses were in the 90s, very extremely positive, except for that one, which was a, which just stood out and was a bit of a surprise that given the high degree of positive response, that nonetheless, uh, that particular question, which was the financial value of those highly valued services, only received a 73. We would have expected, given the high, the, 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 uh, the esteem in which the program was held, that people would have indicated they were perfectly happy to pay whatever it was, but that clearly, that clearly was not the case. So as we, the reason that's recorded here is because as we move then through the rest of that initial phase, uh, the phase one report was just keeping a close eye on costs with the idea that eventually there probably would be a discussion around either partial or full cost recovery. And we, we flagged this as an indication and a potential early indication uh, that there may not be an appetite for a great deal of a fee increase. Yeah, that's sort of why I was asking that question. Yeah. Um, uh, next question, page five of the report, page 27. A uh, growing population. Uh, I know it, it sort of addresses the amount of uh, number of private industry daycare spaces that are coming in between the, the, the city, I think it was Sunshine Patch, and seeds and sprouts. Yes, we're. I think it's around 300. But what about these other operators that are coming into being? Has that been factored into? And how many spaces? It's mentioned a bit later in the port. The trouble with that is, to use a term from Silicon Valley, it seems to be a bit of vaporware. There's a lot of conversation, a lot of applications, but there's been concern both in our conversations with uh, with senior staff, with uh, the program staff, and with parents that. Uh, despite having hoardings up and signs and, and applications of one kind or another, that little actually has materialized since those those two initial providers. So some concern around uh, either whether they will ever come at all, or if they do, when what their timeline might be. Okay. Um, right, I got more questions, but I'll let sure. But I need to yeah, process for a second. Staff? May I just follow on from that? Just one quick question. I just want to check my understanding of this. Um, there's reference made, and I, uh, again, that uh, uh, you also alluded to it. I can't remember the page that it's mm -hmm. on. There's reference made here to the difficulty in some of these um, would be providers of childcare service uh, gaining accreditation and licensing. Yes. Um, is that entirely within the control of the province, or is there anything that the municipality can do to facilitate that? Could we? Would it be at all possible to have a fast track for or, or a? Please, um, regard specifically no, to licensing. That's a provincial licensing requirement. So anybody could come to the municipality and say we want to open private childcare, which is one step. But the step is the licensing piece after that. So it's our understanding that there are some current potential operators that might be experiencing some licensing requirements. Maybe they haven't met them yet. Maybe they're working on them because they can't open until they've met their, those requirements. So it's entirely <coughs> out of, of the municipal control. But there's 
nothing that we can decide to do here that no. will facilitate that in no. any, other than allowing them just just come to our community to, to come to our community but which i assume that. we're already doing yes. thank you yeah, so we provide the development permit yes Peace. And, that, yeah. and we've already taken steps to fast track that in, in. <laughs> councillor barnhart uh, I did want to follow up on that because I, I think what you're saying is true, Ms. Wilson, but I, I do think there are some holdups in terms of the uh, land use bylaw and, and licensing, et cetera, for some of the operators. At least that's, that's been something that we do have some control over in some respects. I mean, again, we have our own bylaws to follow, but there perhaps could be some things we could do to speed that up. Yes, I think the difference there is between the accreditation piece versus um, actually getting the space to, to be able to do that, right? So, um, a distinction, so is there something that we can do? Sure, but on the development permit side, I think land use bylaw, but in terms of accreditation, what we're hearing from Ms. Willison is no, that is a provincial um, responsibility. Good question. And that was my understand. that was my um, belief, but I wanted to confirm that. that yeah, it was you bet. Strictly true. Did you have others, Councillor Stout? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of hands up around the room, so you don't feel as though you need to fire them all off at once. Um, I, yeah, I have a question for it, um, and I guess this may be directed to admin as well. And there's uh, on a somewhat different li line, though. Um, there's reference in the report, again, I'm going to have to struggle to find a page, um, to um, if in, it's under option one, where we, I think, um, to the, to the items that are excluded in the cost of providing the child care, that if we, hypothetically, and before anybody takes a pitchfork to me, I am not for a moment suggesting that we do this, yes. but that if we close the service, we would still have, or, or contracted it out, um, we would still have a lot of overhead, we would still have some overheads um, providing HR and IT and administration. Um, so my question for administration and, and possibly Mr. Schwartz, you can answer or Mr. Harris as he's here. Um, why can't I get rid of some of those? <laughs> why couldn't we hypothetically get rid of some of those overheads or at least absorb them elsewhere? If, I'm, if I have um, an HR person who's spending 25% of their time on a service that we discontinue, why can't I reallocate that to 25% to other things or reduce the number of hours that that person works or whatever? I'll, I'll start and how you can kick in if you'd like. That's exactly what we would do and that's what the report is suggesting is that those are more fixed costs than they are variable. You've got building costs which has some variable costs around heating and fuel but as far as allocating HR, allocating accounting, we do that based on percentage of use and we allocate, we, we separate it amongst our entire organization. If you took a piece of that out of our organization, we would just allocate it differently without that piece. So effectively, the costs are still incurred. I'm still paying for another, uh, for a it will be allocated. Person. If we had 10 uh, departments, we allocate it in tenths. If we had nine, now we're going to separate it, and now it's going to be 13, 14%. So I haven't actually reduced my costs. That's correct. Would, would that cost not, though, be absorbed over the passage of time? <laughs> As, as my other departments expanded or? That, that, yes, that's correct. That's exactly what would happen. Yeah. The, the, the anomaly there could be the building. The building is still ours. It's, it's in our possession. Yes. You can argue whether it's going to stay in our possession. It's going to be pretty difficult to separate it from the chemical arena, so arguably it's going to still be out. Okay, thank you. We can go around the room. Others? We got other questions here? Councillor Barnhart? I'll throw one in here. Yeah, go ahead. Come back to me later. Um, regarding salaries, I think that's a big big part of the, the cost. It is. And it is in, in all child care programs. I, I guess my question is, how how did those salaries get to be that that high in comparison to other child care programs? And maybe it is an unfair question to ask you because you're reporting on what is. Perhaps the administration in turn. Oh. Did we use comparators, or is this based on the fact that we consider them to be one of the staff in the community and in our city, and therefore we, we are paying similar wages? Just a little bit of history on that, and, and then also when and where did it did they become red circled? Because I 
don't think I remember hearing about that. So okay, you just so, give us a little history. So they are municipal employees, and they have to fit, as such, fit on our municipal grid. So they're on our grid, um, and our grid consists of steps. So depending on years of service, will determine, um, you know, somebody's been here one year versus six years versus ten years, will help to determine where they are on the grid. The longer they've been here, the higher percentage they will earn as, as the years go on. So we've got some employees that are, what, 28, 30 year employees. So of course, they've, they've had increases in years of service, cost of living increases, um, we, we used to call them merit increases. So over the years, these have built up um, so that we do have some higher salaries in the private sector, for sure. Do. Can I ask a supplementary on that? All of the civic employees, I believe there's comparatives to that type of work in the region or in the province. As public works are not paid the same as human services are not paid the same. So is there not an opportunity to look at those wages differently or are they all treated the, I mean, I understand the grid, I get that totally. But in terms of the base at which they started, so, I mean, there, there's obviously there's opportunities to look at that, and hence the red circling, because then we went back out to the market, and the market was paying X amount for a level one, for a level two, level three, and we were a little bit higher on our grid, recognizing it's a municipal grid, and as such, some of the staff were, in fact, red circled to keep those costs under control. So, so we did a review I, of I don't that. Recall, yeah. I, can probably, I don't remember what. When we did that. 2018 okay. budget was the so first year. We, we, yeah. were, we also reduced the uh, grids from uh, 10 step to 5. Can, I, th I think now would be a good opportunity to point out um, on page four, the report 26 of 59, understaffing. Uh, I wonder if you could just speak to um, Clemens. You talk about um, you know, 88% uh, total employee related expenses represent 88% of, of all costs. Um, but I think there, and you pointed out the misconception around um, that only level threes are, are contributing to that. Can you just speak to the, the involvement that the province provides in there? Because I think that, that helps with the um, the misconception that all level threes and, and all of a sudden your costs are skyrocketing, right? Can right. you just speak to that? Yeah. I think it's an important No, there is, there is a, and I learned this in my interviews with the with executives from uh, both the Boys and Girls Club of Canada and the YMCA. Uh, we had, I had a really good discussion with the director of the Y um, for uh, for this region, and she was the one that pointed out, uh, helped me, I, hadn't, I don't know why we hadn't heard, this was back in, uh, in January, I think, I hadn't encountered this yet, but we're, we had proceeded to that point under a couple of misunderstandings, and this was one, was that the fact that the city uh, part, it, it, was a, it was two sides of a pancake. On the one hand, it, it insisted on an extremely high uh, level and quality of delivery, and, and the consequence of that was that, you know, in order to do that, we, we insisted on a high number, if not an exclusive number, of level three ECs, uh, and that that would generate the high costs in, uh, of, uh, of, from the labor perspective, but it turns out that that's in fact not accurate uh, because the, the province um, tops up the, the salaries for both levels, uh, two, ones, twos, and threes. There's a small top up at every level. And while those top ups do not completely make a level one and a level three cost the same to an employer, they significantly reduce down to numbers less than a dollar uh, uh, per hour between those three levels. So the fact that there are level threes here because of the subsidy turns out in fact not to have a level of impact that we had thought it would have would not substantially change the labor costs if the city said we're only hiring level ones because the, pro the, the subsidy would then be withdrawn for those numbers and um, you kind of be back to where you started. You wouldn't gain a great deal with, with that. So that's that's what that alludes to. Thank you. I, I thought that was a really good finding. Um, I personally didn't know about that either, and so I really appreciate you pointing that out in, in the report. It's definitely a misconception around there. So, um, and, and speaks to the quality of the programming, right? Just going to say, why don't you just reduce to level ones, right? And all yeah. that sort of thing. So we, we did originally think that it turns out not to be the case. Okay. Thank you. It's, I, I got a clarifying question on that one because if you go to page 53 of the document, 
page 31 of the report, there's figure 12, suggested provincial core rates for ECE compensation. And it breaks, basically breaks down level one, level two, level three, and I, I assume these are provincially suggested wage rates. And so I'm still looking at a, a fairly good gap in between, and, and I guess it's depending upon what, what you start with as a base rate and what you do to your top up. I'm not sure it's as linear as, as you guys are making out to be here. And as well, I'm looking at these and I'm looking at our grids and there's substantial difference in between what the province is recommending and what's currently in our grid. So can you just provide some background to that? Yeah, you're right. It's not entirely level. I think the, the point I, we were trying to make was that the there's a tendency sometimes in these things, particularly even for someone like myself who's early diving in, you resist the temptation to find that quick solution, that big number that's going to change everything. And for a while, we thought, because it got floated a lot in early discussions, that the level threes were really the cause of our ills, were the fact that we had such a high quality program, we arrived at that high quality program by hiring a certain class of employee, and that drove all of our costs. And that, in fact, turned out not to be as true as we had originally believed it to be. This, to your second point, though, the fact that there is a, we'll describe it as a municipal substrate, there's a layer under that that's the, that's the municipality's portion of it, that, had, that does have a significant contribution to the overall labor costs, yes. But that, it's minimized, like I said, if you were to reduce that simply by changing the class of employee, you, you would gain some back, but it, I don't think it would set anyone's hair on fire. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, the point you made in, in the document here, yeah. a really pertinent one for us to, to consider. Um, Councillor Staff. I'd just like to follow that just a little further. Um, did the private daycare providers receive the same subsidy, or is that? If they are fully accredited, I believe so, right? I know the Y and the Boys and Girls Club do yeah. for sure. So the same economics operate for them as for us they regarding do. this issue, but they, they do. don't employ such a high proportion of of grade three, of uh, level three. That was also a mistake that we had made. We had thought that the YMCA did not. In fact, they do. Their numbers are slightly more balanced across the ones and twos and threes, but they employ a large number of level threes and access the same subsidy. The difference being their starting number is lower. The Y's starting pay is lower. Okay. So the, so the, the difference in pay is more the difference in what we're paying in wages is more connected with the fact that they're on a... On a municipal grid. On a municipal grid, which in fact they exceed. Then it uh, is the fact that they are highly trained employees, yes. Okay, so, uh, can I follow on? Carry on, sir. So when we're, when we're looking at a full cost recovery model then, um, I'm being told that we can't recover a lot of the overheads. Um, where, um, and And... It's not a factor of the of the type of em, of the qualifications of the employee and, uh, and therefore of the quality of the service. Um, so the only ways I've got, and and you allude to this in the report, is to, to roll those wages back, which is or, which we've said or, or, to, or to increase fees. Or, 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 or there's a number of there's a, a page and a half there. I've seen someone's yeah. got it open there of just some very early models of because you probably are unlikely to want to move simply one of those levers. Like you said, you probably want to increase costs a little bit, yes. bring labor, and try to find an equilibrium in there spread somewhere. Spread the pain. Yes. yes, spread the pain. Exactly. Um, but there aren't, what you're telling me is that, that, that there aren't big savings to be made um, by changing the, the number of employees, or but, and, and we can't... Well, we can't because the number, and that's one of the things why childcare is such a painful thing to negotiate in in Canada at least is because the numbers and the the the, uh, the top ups and and all and the the availability of subsidies those are all tightly controlled by federal provincial regulations. Not, regulations, not much we can do. Yes, uh, X yeah. number of children per staff member. That number is fixed. It can't be changed. And they have to have some level of accreditation. They have to have some level of accreditation. Yes. And we're being subsidized for the higher ones anyway. So yes, cost of correct. Uh, the higher ones is, is not such a big increase. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I wonder, just to, to build on that point, maybe just go to page 10, please. Sorry, page 32 of your document. <laughs> so those are the options that you're talking about there, the yes. 50, 100, 150. Yes. Do you mind just spending a, a minute just to speak to that? The thinking behind that. 
Yeah, so what we'd looked at here was, uh, particularly from some feedback uh, that we'd received uh, from, from our conversations with the parents, that there might be an appetite to, to investigate the idea of, of forming a not-for-profit body, a society of some kind, to act uh, in, in working with the municipality that would be uh, governed by parents. Uh, what that would do is that would open up that, that, that fourth column, which the municipality on its own would, for the most part of it, not be able to access in terms of things like uh, charitable gaming money and so on, which is currently not available. Um, and there's other, fund, there's other funding as well that we've discovered since that time. So what we did is then we realized by, by putting that piece in there, you would in fact have three things to, you could play with. You could look at uh, either controlling your costs, you could increase your fees, or you could find as a third column outside revenue of some kind, inputs of some kind from the outside. And so all we did was just suggest what it might look like if you increased fees a bit and then the other two not so much, or increase fees a great deal and then maybe not decrease the, the labor costs so much. That's that's really all there. And they would need to be fleshed out a great deal if sure. if, if council looked at it and went, we we think we like one particular approach. I like the you know the language around we think that this is an appropriate balance of pain uh, across all the possible stakeholders. Um, please dive into that one more deeply and help us understand what the real opportunities are. Yeah. Um, I think we're, we've been focusing a lot on, on this option one here, so let's keep our questions to, to this option here for now and, and try and stay on this theme. Councilor Van Newkirk. Yeah, thank you. Um, the one thing that, uh, that I would also mention too is that uh, the policy that's in place that we're following is also going to, you know, the, the, the volume of level three train staff, right? And so that, along with the municipal grid, is how we've ended up here. Uh, could you speak a little bit to the uh, the, the comment on uh, page eight of the document um, around comparison to other child care programs confirmed mm -hmm. that the ELC staff are some of the highest, if not the highest paid group in the sample. You started off with this a little bit, but I'd like to go back to that and just uh, understand. So it's near the bottom under the impact of labor costs. Yes, yes. And Which page? Uh, page eight. Page eight, page eight on the, in the, in the, within the report. 30, 30 59. Sorry, I'm marking off paper. It's okay. In our yeah, we got all the numbers. <laughs> I don't know what more I could I could say to this. Just in what we've seen, uh, and again, just comparing it to, sir, we didn't really even look that seriously at the private providers because they are. You then move into an apples and oranges situation where the profit motive is becomes very. It just tilts everything into a different flavor. So we we look, largely looked at uh, the YMCA and boys and girls clubs and, and that kind of thing, uh, and and the city's labor costs are still. Quite a bit higher per hour than uh, than those programs. Could I follow Go ahead. And the, sorry, and the, and the point we want to make here, and I was going to make it earlier as well, is I've made it a couple times in here, is that by by relooking at restructuring the grid and by initiating the red circling process, the city's already acknowledged that and is already on that journey anyhow. Is to understand that of the three possible levers, the external revenues, internal cost controls, and raising uh, fees that the cost control piece has already been looked at pretty seriously for almost three budget cycles now. So that, that one's well underway. So I just want to jump in on that particular one. Uh, were you able to look at any of the parent run societies in Edmonton, for example, where there are nonprofits that are nope. essentially that nope. model? Nope. To see where the wages are. Yeah. So I think that would be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So could you provide a bit more background. You, you seem to have a bit of history were, around that. Well, they were run by the city of Edmonton for many years, and then they were on profit societies at that time. And then when they were they yes. divested from the city, yes. they were able to continue on with a smaller grant through the yeah. CSS program. We, we, of the people we reached out to, several had heard about the program, but no one could provide us with any documentation. We're going back a number of years. I can probably provide you a report. That, yep. <laughs> more um, documentation never I'm, hurts. I'm also being told by um, Jody Besso, the supervisor, that we actually did do that in 2018, which resulted in some of the red circling. That was some of the research that was done that got us to that. Because I would have thought the salaries would have been. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just to be clear, when you say we did do that, you did yes. go and look at the, the information? Yes, we got the, the comparables. I might have to go back into the records and look at which ones were, were um, you know, spoken to, but yes. 
that was, that was what attributed to that red circle. Okay, thank you. Other, yeah, Councilor. Yeah, Manager. just going down that same grid. It's you know just to point out here of the twenty-one full-time employees, uh, seventeen are outside of the grid. So the, you know that kind of brings it all full circle with the red circling and how we got there and the policy and whatever else. And uh, later on, I'd like to link the the dollar and quality conversation, but that will pop up later on. So. Other questions around cost recovery option. Councilor Hendricks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for me, the, the two elements for me that I'd like to get out of this is, again, to see the salary grid, to see what the package is today and how that plays out, and also a subsidy report. So we used to, back in the day, and I've been on this council perhaps, perhaps too long, but we used to get what we call a subsidy report, and it used to lay out what all is included in those costs. Uh, I recall the, 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 the council in the year when we changed the format of this particular um, program. And I recall uh, in some heated meetings the grid package that was then laid out. Uh, we had a consultant that was brought in to create the grid package. We had a matrix document, points scored for the number of people that you had, had supervised and children that you would over, oversee and where that puts you in the grid for the entire uh, entire management skill set here, which put it, at that time at least, up to general manager's style and type of numbers. So there are a lot of arguments over where that should fit into that grid at that time, but that was back when Mr. Calvert was still running that program. Uh, we also added some management levels at that time, which I, I argued against um, for, I felt that program ran without all these levels, all these layers. Why do we need those today? Uh, there was also in the costing, um, back then at least, uh, there was uh, leasing and other numbers that were attached to it for the space that was applied against the program. Uh, as I recall, there was numbers right to the CEO, that parts of the CEO's time and effort was put into the costing of the, uh, of the uh, daycare program. Uh, so there was quite a significant shift and change in, in, in the way the accounting uh, had a look at it. And then the salary grid also moved it to a, a level that was pretty significant. So if we could find out where the salary grid is today, where the subsidy report would take us today, that would be appreciated. Got that, Mike? So, really? Of the salaries, of the yes. Salaries. Yes, so including the supervisor, yes. So yeah. the salary costs, Inside the program. Yeah. Yeah, are in this report on page nine. So they do, they have, they're not totaled, but I mean, we've got the four, number of employees, 14, and then we've got the early childhood program coordinators at six, and their salary, the supervisor's salary. So those salary costs are, in fact, in there. Yeah, that's not my that's not my oh. point though. That's oh, not okay. my question. Okay. Where do we sit in the grid with the overall team against uh, the rest of the, the city? rest of the city? Um, yeah, we can. Yeah, go. Yeah, if I mean, um, I think the chair they they the salary grid for uh, early child and after school care has been separated from the grid for all other employees, so they're no longer within that grid. They were red circled in 2018. They were pulled out of that grid and red circled based on the review that was conducted. So they are, they are not in the same grid as other employees. Okay. That was part of the cost of the uh, uh, mitigation plan when the review was taken that been looking at the, uh, what their salary were compared to the group that uh, other municipal or other child care operations. Uh, so therefore, they were red circle, uh, and they were um, the only thing that would potentially that uh, they would get is the cost of living. Such that hopefully, what would happen is eventually uh, the salaries in the private uh, and non-municipal would catch up to where the red circle is. Okay, so I, I appreciate the red circle is the cap right? <coughs> on those on those individuals, right? But I'd still like to know where you were as compared to the rest of the grid. We used to have a committee, uh, which was the uh, a group that would review each and every new salary employee into the grid. It would be nice to know exactly where they sit today, as compared to uh, you know where the rest of the 
management team sits. And I, I understand what you're saying, you pull them out, but where did you pull them out at? I don't know what band they were on the grid. Did you, Alan? I don't know uh, all top, bands. So. Top of the, top so, of the I, I don't know uh, where they are. Um, again, they were pulled out in 2018. Um, beyond that, uh, it, uh, there is no comparison to um, the grid, that grid and what the municipal grid is now. Because how the municipal grid works is that when an employee, or we look at a position, it's not an employee, we look at the position uh, and we evaluate, with regards to the municipal side, we evaluate that position in relationship to all other positions. So there is a uh, a process that uh, Michael Lynn came as a consultant did that, and that's how we evaluate all the employees. The uh, child care was included in that. And so the idea was that because they were within the municipality, uh, and it's all about uh, you know, making sure that staff are treated fairly right across from up and down the scale based on what they uh, do and the, you know, all the things that they have to meet. But what was the finding was, as with uh, uh, COLA, or cost of living increases, uh, and merit increases, and that's the reason you can't compare it anymore, because the child care grid only has five steps. The uh, rest of the municipal grid has 10 steps. So the only comparison would be the year before it was pulled out, right. uh, because it's, it's been totally changed, again, based on looking at the market. So I want to I want to pull us out of this. So I appreciate you, you got you asked your question. It sounds like you're going to get you're going to get the information back. Uh, I'll just pull us back out to the whole point of what we're here for today around that that policy number 24, where it is we say a program you know for 20 percent of the operating cost. So we're essentially we're looking at the 377 thousand number in, in the report that you that you documented there. And so like I, I respect the the fact that you know figure out where, where it came from. Um, but our job here is to figure out what we're going to do going forward. Um, and, and yes, the wages, I think you guys have done a lot of work to, to get us to this point. But, um, you know, I think we need to figure out where we, where we move forward here. And, and so I think you'll get the information you're looking for, which is great. Um, but going forward, Councillor Hendricks, uh, sorry, Councillor Van Newkirk, questions on, on the cost recovery model? Yeah, you bet. Um, I want to go back and link uh, one of the mayor's first questions to one of the comments that's made in the, uh, the parent section. So the mayor's, one of the initial questions was around the 73% uh, of parents agreed with the yes. program. So yes. we, we started off talking about that. And then when we look back into the summary of parents' comments, uh, page 21 of the document you have in front of you there, mm -hmm. under the appetite for fee increases, um, it does say when polled in meetings supported the idea. Majority of the parents when polled in meetings supported the idea of reasonable fee increases if yes. the program could continue. Yes. Does that seem a little bit contradictory to the 73% no, or can you link uh, those? No, in, in fact it is contradictory. Yeah. So the 73% the came from an earlier study right. and it was flagged at the time and then when we met with parents uh, across three different meetings I won't state it was unanimous because we didn't, we, it was nothing official, it was more like, you know, show of hands or just around the table, informal feedback. There, there was a significant, I have to be careful with my language, there, there was some comfort with the idea that if we could keep the program as it is, if that meant, uh, 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 trying to find the right number, not a giant increase in fees, they were clear at this, you, you said there, was, there was a ceiling to it, but if it needed to go up, yeah, there was some comfort with that. I just want to bring forward to the group because that is a contradictory piece. Because, it is. You know, the mayor brought forward that first question, yet in the feedback piece here, it is documented on that page that does say that. So, Would you consider, um, based on, and I appreciate you said, uh, a fair increase uh, mm -hmm. on page 32 or page 10 of your report, you've got options of a $50 average um, monthly increase, 100, 150 monthly increase, those three options. Yes. Any thoughts on, in your discussions, on what would be quote unquote fair? Th those would be numbers one and two, I would describe as something like reasonable. The, the, this is not, not unique to hear, is, is, but it was brought up by the parents. The issue for many families when these things become significantly material is when you have more than one child. 
for a family to cough up an extra 150 bucks a month is, you know, if it's one child is, is for, for many families not that big a deal given what the, what the base number is already, it's already quite high. You multiply that by two or three children and now you're, you're talking about a lot of money. So that, you know, that's what we have to be careful of and if we were to create some nuances around this to really understand where the cost sensitivities might be in a model, we need to look at perhaps even break it down to responses by families that have one, two or three children in the program. And I think, thank you for that clarification, because I, I'm certainly not asking you to speak on behalf no, of the, of no. the parents, and nor would you <laughs> dare do that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's that's an important discussion that we'll get to eventually, but yes. th these are the types of things that I think we need to hear directly from um, from, from folks um, um, around this. Um, I think that'd, that'd um, <coughs> help uh, help with the, the ultimate decision going forward. So I appreciate your your background around it, but certainly don't ask you to speak on behalf of, of folks. Everyone's in a different situation, for sure. Um, Councilor Danlock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just on the issue of cost recovery, uh, page eight of your report, page 30 of our package. If you could go on the screen, please. Uh, we talked about the 80% recovery, 90, 100% recovery, and showed the examples of what would cost increased cost. <coughs> and as you mentioned, they are not small numbers, and I appreciate that. Uh, I believe Mr. Harris, if I may, through uh, our CAO, do we not this past budget go around talk about the actual recovery of cost is close to 85 percent? If I remember correctly, we had uh, an employee leave the, the organization and was not replaced, and then actually we are actually in reality presently around 85 percent cost recovery as opposed to 80. Does that ring a bell with people from budget time? And so that would make these numbers different then, right? Which means people in the audience then we're already five percent closer to cost recovery if the cost recovery is 100 we're 85 now not just 80 and that's maybe a small number but it's still it's a significant part of this report and i'm, I'm not saying the report is incorrect i'm just asking for clarification that we are closer i think right now at 85 percent roughly than 80. could you clarify that if you could please mr harris am I, am I, is my memory incorrect no, through the chair. Uh, no, I don't think your memory is incorrect uh, with the uh, not hiring the uh, supervisor of uh, the school age site. Uh, there were some savings in that. And after the budget, it worked out uh, that there was uh, the 20%. It was, it was probably 80 to 18 in that range, kind of deal. Um, but again, that's only on the budget side compared to where it is in any of actual. Um, uh, we hope that's where it is. Again, it's a base problem. The report was based on numbers prior to, uh, to budget. The, the, uh, the supervisor leaving the organization. Kind of deal. And that is historically those. When you say the report, you say this report here, yeah. you're talking about budget. Yeah. Uh, this report this in front report, of us. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so to Councilor Danlock's question, uh, yes, and also no impact to this report because the numbers you're seeing here are based on the current today. Okay. Okay. Let me digest that for a moment. Get on my another Keep, question. But I'll come yeah. Back so to it. good opportunity. Your, your report highlights uh, the difference between um, the school age site um, versus the early childhood. Could you just mm -hmm. speak to that cost? I think that's an important distinction here. We kind of for lack of a better term, lump them is, is one, 138. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just provide a bit of background, maybe it's you or, or maybe uh, Ms. Willis in there about, um, you know, the, if, we, if the cost recovery model was, was something that we looked at, um, how that impacts the school age site versus the... Um, yeah. From, we'd have to unpack the numbers and really roll them out carefully from, from some kind of pro forma budget, but based on the numbers we've seen, and they're not unique to Beaumont, the, the out of school programs where you've got children who are of school age, uh, but they need some prior to school care because parents are going to work early or after school and so on, uh, they, they typically uh, cost a fraction of what it costs to, to care for younger, much younger children. So, and the, I've, I don't remember what page number is on here. It's, it's like, it's significantly different. So our thinking on a very high and general level is that Focusing on that to any degree is not going to see any financial change in the program because it's it's very close to break even. So um, and to clarify, when you say focus on that, you mean focus on the school age site? Yeah, really pull it apart and see if we just do away with it or or significantly change its model. Does it get us in? Well, it doesn't. Given how small the fraction of that cost is relative to the overall program, 
again, you're probably not going to see a, a, a large benefit from it. Thank you for the clarification. Do you have more thoughts on that? No, because of the ratios, age of children, it, it, yeah. it's such a different model, and yeah. so I. Uh, yeah, no, that's it's, gonna make it it's a good point. Councillor yeah. Van Eucher. Yeah, and just to quantify that, I think the numbers you're looking for were 591, 591,000 for ELCC and versus 81,000 for yeah. school age rate. So, yeah. you know, I think it's, you know, while we're saying that there's a difference to quantify, mm -hmm. you can you can tell that, right? So, yes. 591 versus 81. Yeah. Are we ready to move off that option yet? Any other questions on cost recovery? Okay. Actually, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. If you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, thank yeah, you. Um, I know we talked on it earlier. Could you maybe we could clear for my purposes? I know we state on page, uh, your page 15, page 37 of our package, that the city only uses level two and three personnel in our in our current program. And I know we've talked a little bit about the economic factor only having a uh, ones and so on but is there a program related reason why we don't have any level ones in our, in our facility obviously the labor cost is less for them i get that i mean we've talked about the impact of the twos and three on labor i understand that but is there a philosophical reason or a program reason why we would not have any level ones that would obviously help us with labor cost and get some of the subsidy issue some have dealt with is there something you can expand on please um so level ones have the lowest level of training of and so for us to have the level of quality we truly believe that the level threes have a higher education mm -hmm. higher skill set and so we prefer to attract the quality so i mean level ones certainly have um you know ha have a level that can work in any childcare, but we've really gone on a, on a quality model here so the preference was always to hire the level three and then we got a bigger top up from the province as well for that so okay yeah. um follow up if i may go ahead um i don't i don't i met a number of adults i'm oh, sorry parents of children pardon me about this whole program and i do not question for a moment the quality of our of our program not at all that is not an issue that anybody is going to question the quality of it. Uh, if it came down to an economic question where we had to reduce costs um, without sacrificing quality, which is many companies in this economy are, are having that struggle, keep quality, keep people, keep costs down, something always has to give. The question is, could the program entertain some level ones uh, and not substantially reduce the quality of the program? From a, if we're, I put you on the spot, but this is this is the situation where I'm not asking for any specific. Is there, in your opinion, would there be a huge detrimental impact on the program if we started hiring some level ones to help them become level twos and threes? I know as educational part of it, I understand that you're know getting out with this. Um, we're trying to look at all the various options, and this is we're on the cost recovery model right now. So without impacting the program's quality significantly, could we look at hiring ones to help us with the labor cost, which would also affect the subsidy situation and keep the cost for parents down as well? No easy um, answer, I understand You know what, that. that's very philosophical and that's tough to put me on the spot because... It was not my intention, so... Yes, no, so so I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer that right now. I don't think that's fair to answer that. Um, hypothetically, absolutely, but I, I don't know if that's... I'd, I'd point I'd point you to the one of the earlier discussions around the subsidy that is provided from the province as well. Mm -hmm. um, the six dollars X for a level three versus a two dollars X for a level one. So the the difference is not as significant as as I would say we I would initially would have thought. Um, I agree. And so that that was a good a good piece of information to be brought forward. Yeah. So I, I get where you're. The, the thinking around it. Um, and so, yeah, that would just be my, my comment on that. Um, Sierra? If I can just weigh in on that. that, that I was going to say two things. One was that. Um, the other was, and, and you said it hypothetically, if I was looking at level ones versus level threes and wondered who would deliver the best quality, there'd be no question. So, oh, for sure. So I, I would go out on a limb and say our program would lessen its quality. If we went there. I believe you have some level ones. Do you not on casual? Ones, twos, and threes. Yes. Anyway, sorry. There are some level ones in yes. the program. 
Sorry, my question was predicated on the on the report saying yeah. only twos and threes were the program, yeah. which predicated. Currently, level ones are currently our casual staff. Casuals. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so my, my question was premised on what I read in the report, so I would draw my question. Yeah. No, it's fair. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, and that's fine. Not my intention just, at all. Really so. totally, totally fair question and, and yeah. fair answer. Yeah. Um, sorry, good. No, let's, uh, yeah, let, let's move on, Councillor Van Newkirk. Yeah, so um, just regarding your answer for the question, both of the streets, um, the one thing you didn't mention in your answer, which is highlighted in the report, is it's actually policy driven. Um, maybe speak to that because in the in the answer that you provided, you said we, we choose we choose number three. We look for high quality, which is fine. But aren't you just like the report is telling me that you're following policy? Maybe if you could clarify that. Okay, that's before it came under my umbrella. Can you speak to that, Joe? Well, I think in the past, um, because of the base salary rate, it was more beneficial for us to hire level three staff and have that three sixty. Top up to to get that money back to offset that salary. Now that um, the salary gap has changed, there's a little bit more flexibility. But the HR policy for hiring is that we hire level three. That's, that's, that's my point. Yeah. I think you. I don't know, in, in the answer you provide, I think you did yourself a little bit of a disservice in not counting that piece because that that's actually guiding the mix of staff that. That we're covering now. So, no, so quite, quite well taken. Yeah, it, just, it wasn't we, information. We, we've arrived at this at this position for a whole bunch of reasons, and, and the policy being one of them. I think that's an important piece. Because no, it was a, yeah. If it was a 2013 you know, policy C24, and uh, you know, when we have policies, we, we follow them. Yeah, so. Okay. That's all I have for yep. option number one. Okay, well, let's move Let's move on to option two partnerships here. Uh, and so both options, one is expansion with partners and then the exit with partners mm -hmm. and kind of your recommendation is a hybrid of the two. Um, yes. So I think you explained your recommendation is, is pretty clear there. Um, I'll, uh, uh, I'll open it up to, to folks um, first for, for questions around around that. That, uh, that option, that recommendation? Yeah, no, I'm actually kind of excited about the recommendation actually because, uh, and then we're finally getting into this part of the discussion, um, as it seems to be able to, it, it hits a number of basis points in terms of being able to to drive that, I didn't really consider it in an economic development perspective until I'd had some meetings with some people that are sitting here in the audience tonight and, yeah. and seeing it in your report. Uh, and the fact that childcare is a driver towards attracting skilled labor yes, to our city. Very much so. so um, I was actually kind of really interested to see expansion, uh, see the recommendation. But I do have a couple of couple questions. Uh, the first one is on page uh, 42, and it's in input, um, and it goes back to the fees that are being charged. And page 22. Page yeah. 22. ELCC charge. Charges have been an anchor to what the Sunshine Patch and others can charge. What, what do you mean by an anchor? Have they been setting to us? Because we've been setting to them, from what I understand. Sorry, which page twenty of your page, oh, page twenty? I'm yeah, sorry, sorry. Page twenty of your yeah. I'll fourth get the second point, number. The fourth bullet point from the top. Forty-two. Forty-two on. Oh, I yeah. see. It just just in a very general sense, when you have a, a, a quality, a, a, Beaumont is is a very interesting, unique place. There's there's no other place like this we're aware of in Canada that has uh, this particular mix of private providers and a municipal program, and perhaps even more importantly than that, has a municipal program that has the the depth of expertise, the reputation in the academic community. Uh, all those kinds of things. So they they act very much as as almost like a kind of a, a, a compass, a moral compass, a financial compass, an academic compass. They set the bar for the, the delivery of service. Would you know one of the private providers provide the same quality of care in another community where they were not compared to uh, a program like the one they have here? I, I don't know. We I, I don't have an alternate reality to go test that on. But that's the sense that we got was that they very much looked to this program, and if they, you know, if we got the sense that this program took a few steps to the left, then the private providers take a few steps to the left as well. So they raised the rate, so would they. So there's a very tight relationship right now because of this sort of 
center of gravity that this program represents, it, it has a strong influence on, on, on how the private programs act, including financially. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then the other interesting comment in, in this report, in this section, was on page 35 of the document, page 13 of the report. City of Victoria, can you sort of flesh out what they're doing and what their role is and yep. how they managed to achieve the, the, extra, the extra amount of spaces? Um, so, yeah, so um, this came out of a, uh, an interview that I had with, with the mayor of that city. Uh, because I'd read something in, in, in the paper that they had done something interesting. And so in my interview, what I discovered was they had done part of what I'm recommending here, which to play a great deal of a more active role in the world of the delivery of childcare than is traditionally the case without going quite so far as to actually be the deliverers of that program. And what they had done is they acted as a, as a facilitator uh, and as a coordinator for the local school district, the provincial government, uh, and private providers, where they played fundamentally two roles. The first one was to bring all those parties together and act as a host and act as a facilitator to be in the conversation around increasing the number of childcare spaces in that city. Now, it's not particularly material here, but just if full disclosure, just because this will probably come at some point, the spaces they it turned out that they were talking about were school age spaces. These were not that that very critical band that we're talking about, which is zero to five. So, just as a point of information, uh, and then so that was the first thing they acted as a host and as a facilitator. The next thing they did kind of harks back to the conversation we had a few minutes ago around the the relative role that the various governmental layers play in regards to licensing and, and the, 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 uh, the technical piece of allowing these, these organizations to function at all. So what they did, again, because they can't, they can't actually accelerate the licensing of any of these programs, what they can do is what it sounds like is already happening here, is they accelerated all of the business elements. So fast tracking approvals, and the very unique thing that they did and what the opportunities for that would be either here uh, in the proximity to Edmonton or within Beaumont or within Alberta generally, was they specifically got the school district on board and they went through every parcel of land that the school district owns and tried to determine where there was land available and then created a pre-approval process for certain kinds of structures. So they basically created a templated, this is, this is what we will approve. If you can put this on our city planner's desk, it will be approved. So they also fast-tracked their part in approving the, and I'm, I'm not a developer, so I don't know what all the language is, all the, the variances and the you know setbacks and blah, 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 the building structure and the building code and so on. So they, as was suggested here earlier, they looked at the parts they could play a role in, and which is largely around the land piece and, and, and the tracking of the availability of actually allowing a business to set up, and then accelerated that piece in collaboration with the, with the school district. Okay, I'm gonna jump in here. I wonder if you could just maybe paint me a picture on this recommendation. Um, so, our, and, and jump in here if I'm getting these numbers wrong, but essentially yeah, we're looking at roughly right now, there's approximately 400-ish sites um, right now. Uh, your, your report says that we require about six, just over 600. Yeah, so we're the numbers at, are very, I was surprised how hard it is to pin down to within 10%, but the absolute number of children requiring commutes, it, yes, yeah. we thought it would be easy, it turned out not to be, but yes, as far as we can tell, it's going to be somewhere in that 600 plus number of probable total spaces. So we got a delta of two to 300. Um, 200 would be a reasonable target to begin to kind of wrap our heads around, yes. And I also want to acknowledge the day homes and all that sort of stuff, which are, I'll, I'll call it very hard to track um, yeah. from, from yeah, there are the registered yeah. ones, there are the unregistered ones, all yes. that sort of stuff, and there are the workarounds that, you know, so um, that, that number can't, isn't 100% um, across the board. So your recommendation is, the phase one is to get us to that 600 number yes. somehow, yes. right? And, and you talk about expansion with partners. Yes. So could you just, um, Explain your how, how you think we could get there, um, and what the impact on uh, on cost would be, and and who who we would potentially look at to get us there. 
You want Sorry. to walk me out onto that plank? Uh, you're here for a reason, right? <laughs> yes, we, absolutely. Well, <laughs> absolutely. So I, I, just, yes. I, just need, I just need you to better share the vision. Sure. I'll walk us through how yeah. we could get there. Yeah. It, it looks good in black and yeah. white, but yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's a great way to put it in terms of the vision. The vision for me would be to do exactly that. There is, to our best knowledge, there are no communities in Canada right now, at least not of any size, nothing approaching the size of Beaumont that we're aware of, where every parent who wants properly uh, uh, overseen, properly mandated, licensed daycare for the child has it available to them. There isn't such a place in this country that we're aware of. So if we look at, at the number here, uh, we thought, I like the way you put that, the delta of 200 is, given the number, the three players, given the number that they already provide, that would imply something like one, only one or two other providers. We're not talking about the requirement for six more providers with 100 spaces each which would create a level of complexity and challenge that might, you know, might seem a bit pie in the sky. We don't think a number like 200, given the number we're playing with already, is an unreasonable number. Um, and as far as the vision would be, is you would mentioned one other piece, which is the money piece. In the end, this becomes a value decision for council and this community. Yep. But one of the things that we're, you know, as we put this together, our thought was to actually take a step beyond what Victoria has done, because. What Victoria has done is come from a very different place than Beaumont. Victoria had no, no existing program. So they're adding on to what we already have. So we need to be very careful here in terms of restructuring what we already have because there already is a good program. So our thinking was since that money is being spent already, it would simply be a way of probably <coughs> using a fraction of that, and I'm not going to get into what that fraction might be, but a fraction of the total current expenditure would go a long way if it acted as a subsidy of some kind to support both uh, you know, a, a, a parent society organization, one or two other non-municipal providers, and, and somehow subsidize that, whether that is through the way it manages its lands and buildings, or the licensing process, the permitting processes, uh, labor subsidies, who knows? Uh, municipalities have a great deal of leeway looked at from an economic development perspective as they would when they're trying to bring a new employer into town and we go what kind of incentives could we provide that new employer to come and set up shop here we're thinking about a similar kind of model okay so just to i want to expand on that and you, you excuse the pun you say op, while developing opportunities for expansion with partners so I guess I'm not quite clear on when you say with partners. Are we talking parent bills, child care services that's private, that is on their own, and, and we help facilitate that? Or are you talking um, uh, under the umbrella of, uh, of uh, uh, municipal uh, run child care, and we kind of bring, the, bring these, um, these businesses or opportunities in within us? I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure how do we get there. Um, right now we're looking at 390 odd thousand right now. Um, so if it's the private where we're encouraging them to come in and yes, we look at our land use bylaw and all that sort of stuff, we do what we can mm -hmm. to potentially look at waiving uh, or any type of fee, that sort of thing. That, that's one way to encourage, sure. right? The other way to encourage is to bring them under the tent, right? I'm, I'm just not quite sure which one you're I looking wouldn't, at. The only way I would see them, and this is again, it's very personal, I haven't even discussed it with my team, so uh, that I would see doing anything like bringing them under the tent would require probably for the city to begin to set certain standards of delivery. So they would say something like, if we're going to subsidize this portion of your operation, whether it's uh, the cost of, of, of you know, the leasing the spaces, some other cost of running the program that, that a municipality would have control over, or simply subsidizing education costs to bring everyone up to a certain standard and so on, all of those things would probably suggest that the city would then also have to set standards that the, that the partner organization would have to meet to qualify for any kind of financial subsidy or, or consideration that the city might offer. Okay, so but I'll, wouldn't, that wouldn't be my first choice. It would be to kind of not have them come under a tent. <laughs> the city would simply make things as, as, uh, as easy as possible to really make this a very fertile ground for either a, a, a not-for-profit or for other providers private providers to set up. Yeah, so I'll close my thought on this. I, I, I think it, it sounds great. Mm -hmm. I, just, I don't, from here, I, I can't see the, how you get to the, the end point. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll shut up and let others speak, but that, that's kind of where, I, it, it sounds great on here, right? But mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't have the full picture laid out, but uh, we've got the mayor and then Council Van Newkirk and then Council Danla. Yeah, no, because I'm, uh, 
I like the term universality of care and so that hmm. having it available and one of my questions was actually what would that look like so 200 extra spaces to 300 extra spaces give or take and of course grow as the city grows uh, awesome thank you um, but I, th I like the I like uh, and, I, and that's why I don't mind like if we can spend the same amount of money we're, we're spending and achieve that goal I think that's worthwhile and, and we should be delving further into this. Yes. And if we can become a coordinator uh, and, and eventually phase ourselves out of, of, uh, of providing and, and, and support the university out of care within, in Beaumont, and that, that's something new, it's innovative, and it's something we should be supporting. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the question, yeah, I have to say, I think I'm going to recommend that if we go with this space, that I don't think we're going to get the exact answers tonight, uh, and that perhaps this would be something that goes back for further investigation and so I want to pick up on a point you, you just made where you said we can do we can expand to fill 600 spaces and get universal coverage mm -hmm. without increasing costs that's great I think everyone will sign up for that yeah. I don't know how you get to the without increasing cost part where do you where do you see that in here well without in, yeah well uh, the trick is is, is because th there's a there's a there's a there's the three components there's the, the, the subsidy the wages and the fees and so work on all three of those items to make sure that um, they all remain in proportion or is going to have to be done so I, I don't think you're going to be able to keep it exactly the way it's running and be able to achieve that and keep the same subsidy so and you want, i think there's a lot of work to be done you want to jump just, in? yeah just a reminder too and this was something the parents brought to my attention that we had done a poor job in the first report of identifying a parental group specifically as as one of those partners the way we for, use the language around the initial report it really made the partner sound like it would either be only one of two possible groups either a, a group of either a or a group of private providers or something like the ymca and then full stop whereas we were reminded that there are other organizations that could spring up to act in partnership with the city and you know, as far as because I agree with you, right now, how how one moves forward from here, there's a bit of grayness into the distance around how that exactly happens. But I do think there's a real appetite with the parents, and as we looked at some, you know what that might look like, we think that's that answers one of those questions as to who would that other party be. Okay. Sorry, it could be multiple parties. Probably would be in the end. Yes, Councilman Newkirk. Uh, I've got about three thoughts here. I'll start with one just that follows up directly on what you were saying now. Um, we've talked a lot of, around this table um, in this room about uh, volunteering group burnout and we've, yes. we've tried to get groups together, we've tried to form committees which the community has said that they've wanted and then we've conversely struggled to get membership for those yep. committees yep. and so anytime we talk about forming another committee or another society, um, today I'm hesitant um, yes. because of the conversations I know that we've had in this room as a group uh, that we, and that we've experienced. doesn't mean it's not an option. That's just my, that's just my thought following that. Um, it's back, a risk, a very real risk. It is yes. for sure. Um, so um, just back to my initial question that I that when I raised my hand there, <clears throat> I want to talk more a little bit about partners. Um, the mayor and uh, Councillor Montgomery Swain were talking about partners here um, and needing the right partners and identifying um, in their in the report it says that. You know, in a preliminary conversation with you know a couple of groups, you know the Boys and Girls Club or the in YMCA, the it yep. sounded like there was some positive steps or some positive uh, thoughts around that, and then also thinking of you know the parent group as partners. And uh, the comment would be is needing the right partners. And uh, you know the conversation is you know are we in or out of childcare, or yes. are we half in, right? And that I think is going to be a fundamental question before uh, we come to any kind of closure tonight. Are we in or out or are we half in? Because that's going to guide where we're going with this. So a uh, question for yourself is uh, in the current recommendation, um, if you wouldn't mind uh, take a moment to think, but just defining the barriers to the current recommendation. Now I know there's you know a significant write-up around that piece, but the Coles notes on the, on the barriers to that you know, the current recommendation. It would probably be two things. One is that, as we've already chatted earlier uh, with the chair in particular, is that the, the model would be, I'm not aware of one existing, which means we're inventing a wheel. So if we did that, there's, right at the moment you do that, there's significant cost, risk and cost, because when you're starting something from scratch, 
uh, you're going to pay for it. So there's there's probably no way around that. Uh, and then the complexity of it in, in terms of, of you know determining, for instance, uh, in terms of what kinds of policies or bylaws or processes a municipality can or even wants to or is allowed to put in place that would set, for instance, things like standards that would allow a partner to access funding and so on. Like that whole model, that alone represents a very high level of complexity. And then the second one you had pointed to, which is a very specific piece around who exactly would those partners be. Uh, if we look at private providers, that creates some complexity because there's a different, there's, you know, we have to be frank about the fact that even for the highest quality, and I think we alluded to in the report, the highest quality private provider, there is in the end a profit motive. They're in this to make money. They want to make money ethically and by delivering a great service, no doubt, but the motive is to make money, which is not the city's motives. So now you're looking at the alignment of that. The not-for-profits we spoke to, they're certainly very interested. They're, they're two, I thought, again, before we started our conversations with the Boys and Girls Club of Canada and YMCA, that they would be similar models. In fact, they're completely different models. They have nothing to do with each other in the way in terms of how they would do this. Um, and they have extremely high standards. They made that, both of them made that very clear in terms of what would be required of the city in terms of contributing particularly space, okay. building, a building in partnership with them. So. And they're, they sound like tough negotiators at the table, so that, that, would, be, uh, that would be that. And then the, the whole issue, and you've, you've just alluded to it, which is the, the third possibility, and it could be all three. It doesn't, I'm not saying that it can only be one of those three options, which is some form of a parental society, a parental group, a, a local community-run group that acted uh, in partnership with the city. That has a third form of complexity because it doesn't even exist yet. So we don't know what it would look like and what its roles and responsibilities would be and what the respective roles of those two partners would be in, in, del in the actual delivery of child care services. So, follow um, so uh, in its current capacity, um, if this was wrapped up as a business, would a third party entrepreneur come in and say, I'll take it over? If they just like any any business, uh, if the conditions were favorable, yes. One of the one of the challenges is that the conditions for being profitable in the world of childcare are not favorable. Uh, the degree of regulation, the degree of, of requirement for delivery, uh, the costs of you know the fixed costs, the operating costs of, of buildings and so on to have them met meeting certain standards, it it is a very expensive business to run. A very expensive business to run. So we really have to look at the mechanics of what support would we give a business like that if we were to encourage them to come to town? Yeah, and I think that's that's why I asked that question is because I was expecting that answer. Is it's yeah. not as easy as just doing that, is it? No, um, no there's absolutely a lot to not. consider, and um, to get to this point, there's been a lot of effort and a lot of decisions over a lot of years to get here. So yeah. um, the whatever decision is made tonight for any kind of direction is not going to. Neither, right? Like, no. There, no matter what we do here, there's going to be a plan, and your recommendation will lose that transition plan. So, yes. Yeah, that, that's good for you. So, before I jump to Councillor Denlock, <coughs> um, respect to that, I don't know if you answered the question. Um, my understanding through phase one, essentially, you we went and had a conversation in its current state. Is this something that um, that a private business would look to take over? And my understanding is that that answer initially, anyway, was no. Under um, the current conditions. Under the current conditions. Yeah. Thank you. So I just, I just wanted to clarify that versus um, the. I appreciate the, yeah, the answer. Change the nuance. conditions. Yes. Correct. Yeah. But right. Thank now, you. No. Yeah. The yes. Well, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Council Dallin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you hit on my point, uh, both yourself and right. Councillor Van Newton, which is fine. Is that my understanding is that presently, um, actually, I'm going to just going to narrow it down for a moment. So we're providing a ten dollar service. They charge eight dollars for it, effectively, correct? And I believe through your discussions with potential partners like Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCA, they're not prepared to take over the existing model for that reason because it's just not it's not making any other than space. Rates, the next thing is that right. the current cost structure is too high for them. It's too right. rich. Yeah. That's kind of my point. So the question I'm trying to get my head around the recommendation and trying to see the vision going forward. Okay. On the premise that, and if I may just refer to your report for a moment here. In the very first paragraph of page 24, our, our page 46 in our package, phase one, um, development opportunities for expansion with partners to achieve a target of universal availability for child care services in Beaumont. So that's suggesting to me that your recommendation is that 
it's up to the city of Beaumont to provide universal child care, which means, to me, that means universal for everybody means we need 600 spots. Yes, correct. Is the agreed upon ballpark number. Yes. So the recommendation to me is telling us that, you know, we should, as a city of Beaumont, expand the program to provide the 600 spots and then back away from it. Now, if maybe we go one step further okay, yeah. on that premise, then if we're already losing 20% on the model at, at less than 200 spots right now, yes, to go to 600 spots, we're at 375,000 in the hole right now. Yes, at 600 spots will be a million dollars in the hole. What partner do you envision in this model will take over that program as the city can step back? Because part of the recommendation is that the city will step back eventually. Yes, how are we going to achieve that? I'm, I'm, under, I'm not having I'm having difficulty getting my my head around the vision in this recommendation yeah. to get to where you want to be. If the objective is to provide universal availability, yes, that means 600 spots. Yes, that's a big expansion. That means at least a a, a building or some kind of facility. So I'm just not under, under I'm not. Well, there's two I, I things. Get One is yeah. I'm one would be that that 600 is is net. The marginal gain would only be 200, because we there already there is an existing 400 spaces. We're talking about an additional 200 spaces. Again, we're throwing numbers around here, or I'm throwing numbers around. I just want to be careful. It could be double that. It could be half that. But we're using that just so we can have the conversation. So we're looking at a at a partner or partners to make a commitment under a certain model. So the real initial work is to, is to define, as has been asked around here, what would that model look like? That, that's really what this first part of the, de of, of the uh, sort of the step one would be, is defining a model that would see the city for a while and the two existing private programs and probably some form of a third or fourth program beyond that. Those, that collection of programs together would probably arrive at something around 600 total spaces. The next step now is, in, in, and again, this is, we, we, we've said it in here, this is a bit of pie in the sky. The easy, easy thing, but the, the more clear cut thing would be once we got this, for the city to simply step away entirely and allow the, the market to take over and effectively we're, we're back to a, a complete withdrawal of services. We're suggesting, and it needs further fleshing out, that there is a step in between there somewhere where we do not entirely lose everything that the city of Beaumont and this excellent program has done to this point by simply reverting to what every other municipality and city in Canada has, which is a hodgepodge and a patchwork quilt of private and public or not-for-profit programs doing the best they can and leaving lots of holes in between. What that model looks like, I, I We've hinted at it, but it needs further exploration. So I guess the question then is, I think where, where Councillor Downlight's going is, we're setting the, setting the process, the model up um, with the municipality. How are we setting them up for success for the market to take over? Right? At what point, how can the city possibly get out if we've um, essentially um, you know, got out the city program plus the, the two existing ones and another one? Yes. We've kind of facilitated that conversation and facilitated being providing capacity. Yes. How are we ever going to be in a position to say, okay, now that capacity is gone, is it realistic for the market to go in and say, yeah, now this is this is an opportunity for us? I, here? I, I believe. I think it's challenging, but I think it's realistic given the fact we're talking actually about roughly from of, of the the city's portion of the responsibility of it over overall six hundred is one hundred and fifty children. Uh, what's the total number of just in the yeah, but in the in the 78, right? In the early child program? So there was the, the ability of a group of partners to absorb 78 spaces, given this model, is it's not trivial, but it doesn't strike me as impossible either. I think if I think if we get hung up on the idea that it's that we have to find 600 spaces, yes, that's that's overwhelming and unlikely. Yeah, we're looking we're at the only talking about 78 kids really in the end, as far as that's the piece that up until now has been ours. And at some point, we hand the direct responsibility to deliver that to someone else. Yeah, good clarification. Thank you. Did you have another one before I go to the mayor? Uh, I did, but let me just. Yeah, Mayor Stewart's ready. No, let me just jump back at a moment. Yeah, I got I'm, I'm chiming in on this conversation because part of building this model is not necessarily um, building the new spaces to the status quo, so that we're not we're not going to be putting the same level of subsidy into the new places, into the into the new partners that come that we're going to try and encourage to do it, and so. I'm not entirely, 
Yeah, I'm just not entirely. I'm I'm entirely sure that if we're going to try and exit and, and turn over, we have to, the the model of, that we currently have to do has to change, and so that's going to, like I said before, have to facilitate some work as part of the in part of phase one, so that phase two can happen of changing the fees, changing the wages, outside agency bringing money in. Like th that has to be part of the conversation. Councilor Barnhart. Uh, just to maybe take it a little bit of a different direction, but on page twenty six. You do mention, and I, I just think it needs to be brought up at this time, the, the cost benefit, but it, it's the social return on investment is something that I think you hold to the highest. Yep. And mm -hmm. you're saying the investment that the city of Belmont would make to this has a benefit that right now it's difficult to quantify. It's difficult, and I appreciate the, the mathematical uh, and economic discussion and, and reason for doing things the way we do things. Mm -hmm. but. We are really saying that there's a place that the city could add this to its mandate of services it provides yes. for an economic reason. Yes. And it's not well thought out. And it's, I mean, it's not well, it is well thought out in some sectors, but mm -hmm. we haven't really embraced it at the municipal level because we're leaving these types of programs to provincial and federal uh, partners. We don't have enough support in our province to do what this is telling us to do or suggesting we should do. And yeah, I, I really am listening loud and clear to what you're saying. I like what you're saying. But if we reduce the model and we reduce the quality of the model, we're not going to get these same benefits. So without the province or the feds helping us out here, I can't see the financial way to go. I'd love to. I really want to. <laughs> and I'm looking to you as if you could help us to do that. But where is that money going to come from? It takes money. To keep this model going, it takes more money. Yeah, and that's why in the in the, the basics of the model, we are saying that the we're very. I tried to be very careful around the, around the language. The only thing, and I know it, this is not it's material, but it's it's still. It's, I think it's important for at least for us in trying to find a way to both preserve the quality, to achieve the economic benefits that we believe exist there, and yet at the same time answer the question: Should a municipality be in the business of the direct delivery of childcare? We're perhaps, you know, one way of looking at it is we're not even suggesting you reduce costs. You might end up investing exactly the same amount of money the city's investing now uh, or more. But for, as someone said earlier, the benefit to that is that you now act more in the facilitative role rather than the delivery role. And since we strip out, in imagination, stripping out a bunch of operating costs and so on, there should be some, some gain to that. Um, and you're allowing for expansion without any significant increase in the costs. Because what we don't want to see, you know, ideally, and again, this is the community's decision in the end, but what we wanted to take a strong position at, to simply ask the question, is there any possible way forward um, that allows for a complete expansion to where, where every uh, parent who requires a space for the child would have one, but that doesn't drive costs up significantly and doesn't cost, doesn't throw the baby with the bathwater trying to find a way to do that. And, and in the end, it may be judged by, you know, a group of financial people getting together, no, that's not possible, but. Yeah, that's a, careful with that analogy in this room. Yes. Uh, so just a, a time check, we're at, we're at 6.30 here. Uh, I'm happy to keep going if we want to here. Um, I just want to see if the folks need a break or anything like that. Okay, carrying on. So I had Councillor Van Newkirk and, and then Councillor Yeah, Hendricks. I'd like to just keep going from your, your strain of thought there. And um, I don't know, maybe, ground the discussion a little bit because it sounds like we're getting pretty out there with ideas and recommendations and stuff the you know the conversation came up and i believe the uh, was it the mayor that put the first uh notice of motion on and the conversation came out of budget and mm -hmm. it was as you go through you see a line item and you take a piece of uh, a piece of the budget and you said how much you know what's the bang for the buck for a grade a new grader you know increased street sweeping snow plowing on the winter and all of a sudden you know it's like okay there's um here's the number that's left for x number of spaces okay well i guess let's talk about that is what was said so then we get to, then we get to here um so the budget piece is what brought the discussion to the table um i think if we're gonna uh, I, I feel the recommendation took a very switzerland approach <laughs> uh you know it, not trying to uh, negate all of the positives that there are, but you know, um, how do you get out? How do you stay in? Whatever the the recommendation is, try to do everything 
it might work, right? And uh, that, that's how I kind of felt about the recommendation anyway. So when we look back to any kind of decision that we're going to make, um, you know, I think we're, we're back to fundamentals uh, again, um, which is around, um, is the municipality in the business of childcare? And if the answer is yes, then we proceed down one path. If the answer is no, we proceed down another path. Um, if we if we say okay, um, when we all agree that we're going to go down a path of facilitation, great. Then we, then we go down that path. But uh, I I don't hear consensus in this room for one of those paths to, to go down um, to figure out you know which which path we're going to start down. Um, then we go to Councillor Barnhart's comment, which I think is very fair, uh, following yours around. Um, how much money are, are are we putting towards this? And it could cost more, right? So, um, you know, I've heard all sides of the childcare discussion. I've heard from uh, folks in the room. I've heard from, you know, there's been many great, well thought out positions sent into council uh, through email, read them all, went through them all. And there's a philosophical question, I guess, that needs to be answered before we, around this table, before we can start deciding where we're gonna get to. How we're going to get there? Um, is the municipal is the municipality responsible to be involved in childcare? You know, if we stay involved, then the discussion is you know x number of spaces for x number of dollars and x number of space, dollars per space. Um, you know, what does that look like on the outset? And if we decide that we're going to spend more and we're going to make it be a leader in that, then great. Then we've decided that together, and that's what we're going to do. And the community needs to be informed of why we're spending more on childcare because I think there's a large facet of the community that isn't in this room that you know has feelings around um, why are we spending that much money for you know this this game and there's there's conversation on both sides of that so um, I wonder how we're going to get to that tonight uh, for administration to give that uh, to give that direction to administration uh, that's you know, that's where I'm at for now Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so great. I'll I'll just add on one piece before I go to Councillor um, Hendricks here. You talked about the goal of the outset. Are we in or are we out? The other goal that, that I think we around the table really wanted to get to is to provide some predictability on this, some long-term solution, right? Like we don't want to have this situation. It comes up every four years, new council's coming up uh, in, uh, in however many um, months. Um, days and no one's counting but anyway the elections come in a couple years or whatever and, and then you're going to go through this process yep. again someone's gonna look at the budget so my my concern around this one here is that that doesn't provide that predictability it, it, it is a uh, it is okay we're going to go through and then in two or three years time we're going to see how that model's working and then we're going to have this conversation all over again right so um, I'm not saying predictability um, over over service is, is is where the weight on, on where some of the folks would land, but I think that it's worth acknowledging that we one of the things that the number one goal for me personally anyway was to provide some predictability around this, and and I, and I can't see that in, in the option that you recommended. So um, I just wanted to ground that, add on to your grounding yeah. uh, comment there, yeah. Councilman Newker. It's important, and the word reliability is in the report a fair bit, and it mm -hmm. was mentioned in the, the predictable and reliable part was mentioned yep. by by parents and yes. by staff. Yep. Yeah. The other thing we don't mention uh, is around timing around this, and you can imagine the anxiety levels uh, around this. Um, and and you know, hopefully we, we have a, at the end before we leave here, we talk about um, so the timing around around not only us making the decision, but also when that would look to to be implemented, right? Because that I think that could we could easily not easily, but we could relieve some of the, the concerns around this that. This isn't going to happen in, in October's budget where all of a sudden we, we choose an option and, and, and the drastic changes in us scrambling to find these things. So I'd like to see a, a conversation around that and maybe that's, um, can we give you some time to think about about that um, just to provide a bit more time and predictability. But uh, Councillor Hendricks, sorry, I, I kept you waiting there for a while. Not at all. No, I just, uh, t for me, the finish line is a performer. Where are we at with the performer package? And like I say, if a business came in and looked at it, um, Recognize that 600 spots were required. Subsidy would just go up. Losses would increase. You, you turn those people away. But as a community, we're no different. Mm -hmm. You know, like the reason we're here is because we're looking at a you know, per child subsidy, which is getting it's more and more significant. We're saying what what has gone wrong? What is driving the bus? Where is that math coming from? Is it our structure? Is it the way we're providing the services? <coughs> is it our management style? Is it the accounting? 
that's driven this. That's why I'm suggesting a, a uh, subsidy report. Just And I realize it's kind of in here. If you read all the parts, <laughs> the subsidy report kind of exists. But if we just had a line item that took us there and said, okay, just because we're, if we say no to, uh, like you say, IT support and all the rest, those people don't go away, right? If, 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 if you take those numbers out, those people still don't go away. Um, is the space being, you know, in terms of lease, that space still exists. We still own it. Uh, we're in a we're in a facility that's already to the to the to the max in terms of what we can get in there. Uh, I think how many councils have tried to add space, room, washrooms, walls, windows, you name it, to try to make that space work. I've been an advocate to get out of that space. I've, I've suggested, and I was the one who brought the YMCA to Beaumont and said, "Hey, they at one time were going to bring 300 spaces to us and and set that up with the aquifer phase two, and they were going to take over the entire facility. They needed the land for a buck, and they would build the rest and no subsidy. Um, you know, we have to do something that either allows people to uh, access this, that there's no cap, that it can't be just well you happen to be on the waiting list. You get people that are getting on the waiting list prior to being." From what I murmured, pregnant, just so that there's some timing, you know, uh, to, to to get a shot at this space. That has to stop. Either we're in or we're out. If we're going to do it, let's do it right. If we're going to build it, let's build it. If if we're drowning in, in in fees structures that are tied to more accounting issues than it is the physical staffing, then I say, okay, let's sort that out. Let's clean that up. So I would like a, a subsidy report. I'd like to know where the salary grid. How did it get there? If, again, if I was a business owner, I'd be I'd be reviewing that regardless, and and if I had a performa that takes me to 600, because as I'm adding kids, I'm supposed to be making more money, not losing money, not taking more of a hit. So I'd like to see that as, as a document. And where is that line? Where is the pain threshold in that line relative to revenue and income, right? Slash expenses, right? Okay, thank you. Good comments. I think we're kind of going around on, on the recommendation. The, the one option that we didn't really discuss, so you added the hybrid in here, the one option that we didn't discuss or uh, provide an opportunity for questions is around the, the exit um, end involvement, exit with partners piece. Um, and so you kind of got there through your hybrid model of let's, let's get a way to fill up the capacity first. Um, and then we look at exiting once the, the 600 spaces and that number is only going to go up. But once we get to that, that unilateral coverage, um, I'd like to open up the floor for folks who had questions around that um, that end involvement with a partner conversation. Councilor Van Newkirk. Um, so is it okay if we kind of blend the conversation between option three and four and then exit with partners, exit without, or do you want to bucket those? Yeah, we're all okay. meeting, right? Let's go. Okay. Uh, um, so, when, so we've talked about the, uh, um, the demand and capacity. We've talked about the numbers and the spaces. We've talked about the YMCA Boys and Girls Club. We've talked about level of training with ones, twos, threes. Um, and one of the questions that comes to mind uh, from a business perspective is um, when we're talking about making a transition plan, if we did find that there was an option with the YMCA or the Boys and Girls Clubs, the, you know, the folks that have done this big, uh, not that we need big, we're looking for 78 if we were just to do that, but if, they, if we were thinking bigger and doing bigger, is there an option to have, you know, we're talking about taking on and, you know, basically getting you guys to do a transition plan, you know, that's, that's the last piece. Yeah. One of the things that we do and think about in business is, well, if the next group's going to get something out of it, what are they willing to put into it? You know, so one of the things that isn't highlighted in here is, you know, is there an option to get the new partner uh, to make the transition plan and provide that to the city for a um, you know, I think that's something that you should yes. talk about and think about if we do go down a path of another partner coming yes. in, because in business it happens, and um, you know, there's there's two sides to the deal, mm -hmm. and if there's that much upside to come, then you know, put some time in and get some skin in the game. So that's one comment. Can I, I want to put, put, pull on that? Uh, you're assuming there that a, a business partner, an external partner, is willing to come in and take over the program at, at its current state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and we just had that discussion. Uh, no, sorry, not in its current state. Okay. This, this is if any partner that's coming. Um, there, it's there's basically there's a, whatever we decide there's going to be a transition plan. So whether we exit all the way out, there's a transition yeah. plan, or we exit with a partner, there's going to be a transition <laughs> plan. So whatever that transition plan is, and if someone else was part of it. 
what would they be part of when you when you put that type of paper. So that was just a comment. Um, and then when we talk around uh, the one question we never got to, which I started on earlier, was the the cost versus quality philosophical conversation. It pops up a few different times in here. Um, one of the one of the comments is around. Um, it's page 16 on, of the paper version on the bottom, bottom bullet. Um, future considerations, this is just accidental Beaumont. Part, uh, part of the messaging would address the perceived shift in standards between what Beaumont has been mandating and what is cost effective for other operators. So this is a, a key philosophical piece that is going to be behind every decision. <coughs> you wanted all these high quality folks and why is less okay now? Right. right, so you know that is going to be uh, as much of a, an important question as we move forward here uh, than anything else. Um, shifting in standards, why why is it okay now? Why wasn't it before? So when you think about your staffing mix, and you think about a private provider's profitability models needing to have a healthy mix of staff based on your inputs, your outputs, your cost, and all all of those types of things, there are businesses out there that look after kids and child care and their subsidies and, and everything that goes through it. So all of a sudden we should take all of that and we're, let's say we found a solution and Beaumont is not in the piece of child care. The next question that comes up is, is what are you going to do with the money you save? And, and that's where mm -hmm. this option number four takes us is it says, um, you know, you exit with partners. So you, just, you got a strong communication plan, um, you know, the success of the plan will spend, depend on its substance. Um, you're going to talk about um, capacities and finances and then, okay, what are you going to do with the money on the back end? Well, um, I respect that question there, but I think that that one um, probably won't be something that we can get up against because we're going to have all kinds of other things to, to spend money on, right? So it's kind of an unfair question, I guess, is, is my comment. People are going to ask it, but sure. Um, where is it going to go? Uh, it's going to go to fund the library. It's going to go to fund, you know, operational costs here or there, right? The, the answer is, is that money is going to go back into the budget and be reallocated to the spot that administration says it's best allocated to. So that, that question there isn't really, I don't see that question as a, a question for this table around this discussion. So that's, that's my notes from three and four. Yeah, so I, I wanted to, I said off the top that we'll provide an opportunity to ask any questions that we have and then we're going to go around the table and, and ask for comments um, on, on the discussion and, and potential next steps. Um, before we do that though, are there other, we've kind of exhausted the questions on the four options, are there any other general questions that, that folks wanted to have asked before we kind of move in? Go ahead, Councillor Barnhart. Thank you for reminding me, I did forget about one. Um, since space comes up with the, um, the option with a partner and expansion, we need more space. And this perhaps is a request of our CAO or the financial manager. Do we have reserve money that can be used to build on our existing site or renovate our site to increase the spaces? Because I know we do, uh, on a routine basis, put money into reserves for all of our services. And given the fact that we are part of the civic service, the daycare is, that some of that money should come back into that program. So rather than thinking all of that money is new money, is there some money available for the expansion? I'm going to defer this to Alan in a second. Uh, as uh, Councilor Hendricks, you triggered this and you talked about the performer and looking at the business case. And to my, to my knowledge, we are not putting uh, any money away, uh, capital money away for renovations or replacement. Harris, Mr. Harris. Uh, can you chair, in regards to putting money away for There's a policy reason for that. Is that something council should have done or could have done in terms of? Could have done. It's a, uh, it's a service it's we haven't planned for the future. The future this year, based on the limit on the number of child, uh, uh, under 38 kids, mm -hmm. there was no need cool. to put money in until council changes the direction, which will then change the budget. Appreciate that. Thank you. Councilor Van Uker. Yeah, just to skim my questions here. There's one more question that's been asked a lot um, that hasn't been asked here tonight, and that's uh, kind of back to the beginning, a question for yourself. Um, if the quality level is high and higher than other facilities, I mean, than other providers, um, it should cost more, no? 
that's a question that's been asked a fair bit. Um, you know, when you when you start comparing um, apples and apples, apples, and oranges, <coughs> however you want to do that, um, you know, we're comparing different providers in this scenario on one hand, and then on mm -hmm. the other hand, we're saying, but there's a higher level of training over here, mm -hmm. right? Yet you read in other paragraphs in the report that one is basing tracing on the other and back and forth. If you're able to comment on that. This, sorry, just so what, what's the question? The question is if the quality level is higher, um, yes. should it not cost more? If the From... primary provider is in Beaumont and we're saying that the, the Beaumont funded piece is here and the you know they're measuring uh, rates of back and forth among each other. It's a common question that's been asked sure. in this discussion. Sure, yeah. Um, again, the, from if this were a business and we were looking at it from you know, from a marketing mix perspective, we're looking at the pricing element. Then yes, it's it's normal to assume that you know you 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 get what you pay for. Um, where things get complicated, and this is why this these questions around the involvement of of, pub, of public bodies and governments with services like this, is that they don't have a profit motive. They have an economic development or a social good motive and measuring the value of that, uh, particularly the social good piece of it, it, it muddies the waters completely. All of a sudden, all the numbers start to dance again because we're not just looking at you know gross margins and net margins and EBITDA, like that's, that's just not the way municipalities work. So if we are a business, absolutely, I would expect to pay more for a high quality service. If I'm in the business of doing good, uh, then I would look at what's the value of that good, either economically or in terms of you know our value statements around a strategic plan and so on. And then the the you know the delivering party uh, might choose to you know to deliver a high cost program at a loss because they're seeing other benefits, either social good or secondary, tertiary economic development good coming out of it. So it gets complicated. So I'll, I'll jump in there just just really quickly. I think it's important to acknowledge that we're not when we're talking about quality here, we're not comparing quality of this particular service versus others in town versus day homes and all that sort of stuff. I think the the quality of childcare is delivered um, across this community is excellent, uh, and, and by no means are we um, are we uh, saying that this one is is of greater quality than, right. than any others. I just I just wanted to make sure that we we acknowledge that point that there is some um, there are other providers who do provide a great service. No, yeah, for our we're community. very careful in that way because the moment we we said it both in the previous report and this one, because you're absolutely right, the moment we get into that, now there's an assumption behind that there's been some kind of analysis that's been conducted to actually stand as evidence that this program is measurably better. Correct. And no one's gone anywhere near that. Yeah, and, and I just I know you put a lot of effort into it in here. Yeah. You didn't really get a chance to speak to it, so I just no. wanted to tee you up there to hit, yeah. hit that one. Thank you. Council yeah. Manuker. And, yeah, and the reason I ask that question is because there's a lot of people in the room tonight that have concerns, and there's also a lot of people in the room that have concerns, who aren't in the room that have concerns too. And I'm trying to ask questions on both Absolutely. sides of this fence, right? So, yeah. you know, so to break it down, and, you know, if we were to say if quality level is higher, and with the caveats, it should it cost more? Unfair question. To an extent, right? For for what we're trying to talk about yeah. here, because there's too many factors to just simplify it down to that statement. There's too yeah. many factors in yeah. play, so that's why I asked that question yeah. because I want to make sure that you know both sides of this discussion are, are looked at, right? And uh, there there are viewpoints that simplify it down to that question. Yeah, and, and I just I don't think it, that simple simplification of that question is fair for the discussion. No. So Sorry, I would agree. Thanks. The one I, I have one last question that's not related to these options um, from um, community members outside of the program. The question and you, you alluded to it a little bit in here. Uh, I'm surprised the discussion hasn't come up around a means test, um, and yes. I don't want to get into uh, what is the right um, option there. But yeah, just initial, your thoughts around that. Um, I guess the, I'll share the feedback that has been passed on that, you know, if there was some sort of means test that they could, um, you know, could see, okay, this is why we're trying to help provide um, for those uh, uh, in a situation where they can't necessarily provide that. Is there, a, is there an option to look at that? I'm just curious if, if you, any of your report here, you kind of mentioned it a couple of times, I, I kind of controlled F means yeah. test to see how many yeah. times, see if there's any, there's no real paragraph on that. No. Uh, and was that deliberate that you didn't go into that, that conversation? We didn't really go into it because as we looked around, we couldn't find anywhere that uh, a means, because there's two, two forms of tests or two forms, other ways of looking at 
why a, a, a public or government body might want to get into delivery. This, and in fact, provincial bodies often do, and that is either for a means reason, or as has been recently been the case with uh, with with uh, with the Black Gold region, uh, where they've said that if there's certain learning challenges. So in, in both cases, you're looking at unique populations rather than general populations. You go that unique population, either for, for financial reasons or for other reasons, deserves, in, in spirit of being Canadian, a higher level of support than, than somebody who's fine on their own. We didn't go into that any further because at the childcare level, we couldn't find any models in the country that use means as a way of kind of channeling their programs and channeling their monies. It seems to be the Canadian drive from what we could see across multiple jurisdictions was simply to get to the point where the parents who needed childcare got childcare. It's so, a very different bar. From a municipality level, and, and yeah. Yeah. my goal here is not to go down rabbit holes, I'm gonna yeah. go down one. Yes, um, go. So from the federal government, based on your income, you get a certain amount of, um, uh, on a monthly basis, you get, right. I can't remember what the, the childcare credit, I, I should yes. know that. Um, but that's based on, on income, right? So that there is a means test to a certain degree there. Yep. Is there an yes. option, um, is, that, is there an option to, to potentially consider for? There is, and that's why I said earlier direct. So indirectly, even the $25 a day program, we know that as the province has historically looked at various programs, the socioeconomic profile of the community or the region that it's providing that subsidy to or chooses not to provide the subsidy to is considered. So we, yeah, absolutely. But as far as as a, as a municipality saying, we have a program, but it's only available to this socioeconomic slice, we couldn't find that in terms of that direct one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, thank you. That was only a small rabbit hole. I'll get yeah, us out no, you, right we're up. back out again. Okay, good. Um, all right, I think I think we're at the the point here where we, we need to go around the room um, and, and get some, some feedback from people on, on these options. I wanted to say two things off the top. Um, I think this council has is, is, uh, done a really good job um, at actually making decisions uh, on, on a lot of tough issues that have come in front of us um, where um, I think we need to keep that in mind here. The last thing, there, there is not an easy solution here, um, but the last thing we want to do is um, push it back, uh, in my opinion, anyway, push it back for more review in six months we come here, we have the exact same conversation going around. So. I realize it's a tough conversation, um, but I challenge us to, to keep up with that spirit where we, we've made a, a, a strong effort to, to make decisions on this. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the mayor. Um, it was your motion to, to have this, um, this discussion um, brought forward. Um, so um, I'll, I'll start with you on, on, on your thoughts on the options, the recommendations, and, and, a, and a potential uh, path forward that, that administration, and we'll let these guys figure out how we can weave this into a nice, concise motion. Um, but uh, just, just your, your initial thoughts without not, not getting too prescriptive, prescriptive. I'm not asking you to say, I want option X and that's, this is why, <laughs> but just your comments on the discussion. Um, well, I alluded to it before, like I, like I said, I, I started to get kind of excited about the recommendation because one of, one of the biggest things when we were having this discussion was the financial model that was putting it in and one of the arguments was, well, it's only programs are only available to a certain amount of people and whatnot. And so when the recommendation came in that we proposed that we could probably use the same, same level of subsidy um, and get universal childcare in our city, um, and and I am fully aware that what's likely going to happen is, is the program we have is currently going to have to morph. It is. It's just going to, it's going to have to. Um, that, that, that's attractive. So um, saving the money would be great. But honestly, if we can get universal child care and provide that as, as a service and, and we're in that advocacy role and we're doing education and we're doing economic development, business attraction and getting partners in to do it and eventually getting out of the direct delivery of it, I, I think that's worth worth looking into um, and providing that service to our community. So that's that's my initial thoughts on it. Um, Can I after you go around the table once? Yeah. So I'm going to ask a follow up question. Sure. Um, philosophically, um, the universal model um, you're in favor of. 
Um, are we, you know, is there an appetite there to potentially look at if it, if it meant, you know, all the value that we've took, we see in this report about what the benefit it brings, the, you know, six dollars or every one dollar you invest, all that sort of stuff, is that something you'd consider if it if it meant, say, actually expanding that program financially? Is that something that you would you would consider as something that is um, worth considering? Knowing the knowing the pressures that we have in front of us for other things, we have space issues, we have. Recreational groups coming to us. I'm not too. I wouldn't be too looking to make too big of an expansion of investment into any one particular program in the city right now. But if we can figure out how to do it within current budgets, um, I think it's worth taking a look at. Okay. I guess my comment to that is I didn't hear how we could do that, but um, well, well, neither did I. But it's uh, it's one of those things that, like I say, they're, they're to have, if we're going to go down this path. And we may get down this path in six months and find out that, that this was pie in the sky and it really couldn't happen. And now we really are back to these things. But I think, I think it's worth a cup, okay. worth exploring the option. And, and I should have clarified, when I said let's make a decision, I don't mean let's make a decision today. We've got to make sure we take the time to make the right one. Um, I just don't want us to keep hunting this down the road because it is a tough discussion. Um, I'll just make my way around the room. Councillor Hendricks, uh, if you don't mind, um, your thoughts on the discussion and the potential path forward. The Mayor is kind of looking at the, the recommendation that, that's in front of us. Do you, I know you, you've talked about the performer and all that sort of stuff, so maybe you need that before you comment further. Yeah, for me, it's, it's more uh, where this, this, this program went uh, and took us to where we are today. So uh, at that time, and this is many years ago, we, we had a structural change to the program. And the structural change uh, created all sorts of elements of issues uh, relative to the personnel that was working there. We uh, had a number of long-standing employees that uh, uh, did not have all the accreditation that were released. New people were brought in, hired uh, in terms of skill sets. Uh, the educational piece was, was a requirement. All of a sudden, uh, our, uh, our uh, expenses started to climb. Uh, and then we started trying to deal with how to, how to deal with that in terms of a, a subsidy per child. And that became a, a long-term issue, which just has never gone away. Every council I've been on has brought this conversation to this particular point. And uh, I've been consistent with the structural changes. Um, I think that there needs to be just a, uh, a discussion on the structure of it of the delivery. It's not so much whether or not we've got level twos and threes and ones parked in there. It's where where are the rest of the uh, pieces of the math attached to it structurally and whether or not that has to be reviewed and whether or not uh, if we have that structure changed, whether or not that has an impact on the bottom line. So I would, I'd be a performer guy. I'm a business case guy. I'm a guy that would like to see uh, the, the, the salary grid the subsidy report that piece brought back to us in a business case to expand this so that it, either you have it or you don't. And either you have it, you, you've got it offered to all. Uh, you can't just have this cap and, and it, it, this is not a private club. Uh, this should be open and available to all. Or at the, you're at subsidy levels that just don't make any sense to a municipality in terms of process and timing uh, of what we have to also provide in all other events. You know, we, we don't have an Air Force, don't have a Navy, right? We don't have a military because there's other parts of government that look after that piece. Of it. And we're the only ones who look after daycare across Canada, virtually. So why are we doing it? For all the right reasons. Then if we're going to do it, let's do it properly. Let's open it up to all. But let's make sure that we're not at a massive subsidy per child in, in trying to uh, trying to create this, uh, this program. I'm all about... Uh, you know, the comments that are in here with respect to the center, uh, U of A, uh, it says uh, major uh, Canadian universities have recognized the Walmart program as a center of excellence in research, as well as Grand McEwen, the University of British Columbia, Concordia, University of Alberta selected Walmart program for research. That's fantastic. So this speaks to what we're doing. But I just say that structurally, we, something has gone wrong. And, and we can't, uh, and, I, and I get the, the conversations about the private guys and that they're there to make money. But they're also paying, uh, they're paying staff, they're getting things done. Uh, they're paying leases, they're getting things done. They're paying utilities, they're getting things done, and they're making money. Uh, why can't we, as a nonprofit, at least break even without all those other things attached to us? So I'd like to see where the structural elements are. What has gone wrong? Can I, uh, so I'm going to pick up on that and, and ask a question of the CAO here. Um, and 
clearly don't have as much experience as my uh, as my friend on uh, to my right. Is it? How do I ask this? Is it council's role to look into the structural performance of the of the um, childcare facility? I think it'd be a combination of a discussion that looked at the uh, the service delivery, uh, the, the service level. Uh, we heard Clemens talk a little bit earlier about this is not a business case. There's socioeconomic socioeconomic benefits that municipalities consider that private business does not. So it's going to be very difficult, and maybe I can refer some of this to Clemens to, to determine exactly what has changed in a structure that, that drove costs up that were not linked directly to service. I guess the, the reason for my question, and I, and I fully get the experience that I just, I just don't have, I, I don't know what I would do if I was sitting up there looking at a looking at a flow chart of a chart. I have no idea, right? I'm not the expert in that, um, nor do I want to be um, or even try to be. So um, I, I don't know how seeing that what uh, getting that structure in front of council how that helps and, and maybe you help me through this I, I know your your lens is around that performer piece and it makes sense that how do we get here um but i don't know if the solution of how do we how do we move forward um helps me looking at a flow chart and, and other options I, I guess for me and, and without getting in the weeds and, and having seen uh, documents that support sort of the math that goes with the the, old, the entire program there's some line items that math that i would debate Okay. And say, listen. They, in my opinion, they don't belong on that on that list. Uh, there's some of the structure that was created when the change was made. You know, uh, I would suggest perhaps doesn't need to be there. Uh, but that's not that's not when, my call. When was the structure change made? Yeah. yeah so I'm I'm going to use uh, uh, the uh, uh, the change when the manager the manager of that area was Mr. Calvert. So Mr. Chris Calvert was brought in, and at that time. That change uh, took place. So if you go back in your records, you'll find that's why. That, yeah, know. roughly when he became okay. an employee. He used to be also the mayor, great mayor, great counselor, and still a great guy. Uh, and he was also uh, uh, given the task at that time under Mr. Gordon Stewart to, to look after this program. But uh, there was some people brought in. Uh, one staffer brought in from St. Albert uh, from a, a privately run daycare, who at that time said, "Listen, let's structure this thing up in a certain way." And uh, then away it went. So then all of a sudden we've got management levels. We've got other things that were starting to be incremental to the, to the overall cost of this. And I'm saying, slow down. We're now starting to get hit with costs that we didn't have before. Why do we need all these layers? And, and I know we got a restructuring just recently and got a whole flow chart of who's who now. Um, I'm just asking the question in accounting. And I'm, Mr. P. Fontaine was the accountant at the time. And he was making the case in accounting principles, you have to apply everybody from the CEO down as a portion part of to this program. So well, slow down. Now we got everybody listed here. We got parts, bits, and pieces. I'm saying, why is that all now being tagged to this thing? And then of course, then we, we also added all the educational requirements that drove up um, you know, the, the, op the operations cost. And then we had, uh, the, the, the case was made uh, by the council of the day, certain councilors of the day, who said, listen, uh, these people are not outside staff. They're part of us. They should be part of the management team. So a consultant was brought in here and was asked, okay, where do we put them in the grid? So that I was in the room when the grid was being discussed and I, and I, and there was a matrix package. There was uh, points added to, you know, uh, if you had so many children you were looking after, so much staff looking after, what have you. And all of a sudden, they're inflated almost to the top of the entire organization. I said, slow down. Now we got math that... You know, uh, PhD is going to be a requirement to get a job in this town. So we can't have that. We got to take this number back to something that's more realistic. So I fought that process at that time to try to get the math back to where I thought it was realistic in terms of the, the chart. So you have at that time 150 employees, I think, of whatever it was. So where does the uh, child care package fit into that 150? Well, are they above the supervisor this or operations this? this that's all something that got plugged in. Well, now their number is, is what got stacked up. So slow down. Now we got that problem. So then we had to come up with a stop a gap, which is okay. Well, then 20% of this is going to be subsidized by others. And you better start creating your own uh, you know, uh, child care uh, parent program where you can go out and fundraise and give us at least 20% of this back because of the hit we were taking on the subsidy. So we went from no subsidy to significant subsidy. And now we've gotten to this point, and I know we've got layers, and I'm just saying, 
In reality, does it matter if where these layers uh, are taken off that performer? Because in reality, if, if they're not, if, if we take them off the performer, they're still there. We still need these people. But why are they being charged against the, uh, the daycare? So we had the exact same problem with uh, BRAC2. When BRAC2 was being built. So I'll, I'll stop you on BRAC2. I'll stop you on BRAC2. Okay. Because um, I think you made your point. If, yeah. I, could, if I could summarize. Sure. Um, basically, you're, you need before you're not in a position to be able to uh, identify any of those recommendations yet. You're, right. you, you need the documentation, you need the background, you need the history of where we got to. Give yourself a chance to look at are there opportunities for us to uh, in the in the current organization structure? Are there other opportunities that aren't called out in here? Is that a fair summary? Sure. Thank you. Can I you know, ask Mr. Harris to weigh in just on a couple of the accounting? Sorry. Okay, sure. Just to clarify. Yeah. Uh, uh, in regards to the analysis, and I believe the number of 357 something was brought up for child care uh, for the loss. I think that's the number that was right. That includes no overhead for any administration, anyone outside of the program. That means no overhead for Kim, for Mike, me, for any. So all those are excluded from the 80 20 calculation. Uh, in regards to the salaries and the grids, that's a different question. But in regards to the 80 20 uh, recovery, it does not look at overhead. So that is, that's number one. And we can provide that information to council. It was, uh, it has been provided to council in the order of the council in the past. Uh, but those, and that's been a discussion ever since I've been here as to whether. You include overheads or not. Um, I understand Councillor Hendricks' uh, comments in, in regards to that's one position, and that is a fair position. But when it comes to the child, the 80 20 split does not include overheads. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead. So, and, and I recognize that it was on page 26, or let's, take, let's call it page 4. My point is that we, we used to get a subsidy report that laid out all the layers, and I'd like to see what the layers are. Okay. okay. We got that. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to Councillor Danlock here. Your, your thoughts on the discussion and potential part four. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the parents' patience with this process. If you can tell, it's a very Emotional issue in many ways is also a very economical issue and philosophical issue at the same time. So I'm going to probably go a bit of a limb here and kind of say kind of how I'm feeling with the whole situation. Um, Missile Government Act does not require municipalities to provide daycare early learning services. Okay, that's my thoughts as well too. However, I want to preface that very clearly by saying our program has evolved over the years to where it is right now. To me, it's an exceptional program. It's got great staff. It does great work for the kids. The report talked about how the teachers in the school system recognize when kids come to class, they were through our program because they're, they're, better, they're better little people from the program. But what I'm getting with that also is that it's not a traditional daycare. Traditional daycare, I talked to parents saying, the kids go in a room, there's a TV, there's a couple of Tonka trucks, there's a puzzle, there's your daycare, right? We don't have that program. We have an exceptionally good program, but it also costs money as well, too. So um, if I suggest you all going on a limb, I'm going to be very blunt in my thoughts here. Um, I'm very concerned with recommendations of expansion with partners and exit with partners. Um, there's too much uncertainty with both those recommendations. I do appreciate you're trying to do the hybrid thing, but I see way too many uncertainties with it. Uh, I'm going to go back to what I said to some ladies at one of my coffee with the counselor sessions is that I'm very proud, and I think you all are very proud of our of our program. Uh, unfortunately, we have been in a bit of a quandary with how to pay for it. So I'm not in favor of option three on page two, which was an involvement unilateral exit. I'm not in favor of that in any way or form. Uh, I'll vote against that vehemently if that ever came to that. Uh, I am more in the cost recovery position. I feel more confident that we can do a better job, um, sorry, not a better job, be more creative with getting some of our costs down. Honestly, have the parents pay a little more. In this boat together, the kids will have the same, hope the same program, level of care, the parents will have some certainty, and there'll be nobody out of a job, hopefully. Now, I'll leave it up to the manager of the program. If, if council were to take the position of, for example, saying two years from now, there's no more subsidy. Now, that may be 
10% more from the parents, 10% from the program, which may involve, I'm just talking as loud here, it may involve a cut in staff, if that's what management decides to do. It may involve a rollback. It may involve some kind of reduction in part of the program to achieve that goal, but it'll keep the program virtually intact, provide the parents with certainty, and get this off council's plate and let us progress with running our municipality. And I think I'm not in favor of exiting the entire program. That would cause way too much disruption. I mean, we're in this program now. We've gone down this rabbit hole for so many years. We've got to get a handle on it. And I think, I won't say anybody loses their job. It's not my intention, but I do believe the program has value. The kids are better off because of it. But there's also, we've all got a, some parents that are in the program told me confidentially they know they're getting a good deal and they're happy with that. They're not saying they're looking forward to an increase in price, but they understand an increase in price is warranted. Uh, what level it is, I don't know yet. Okay, but I, I'm leaning towards cost recovery as opposed to other, other options. So Give I, you where I'm at. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll ask an unfair question. Fire. Um, so you said you're absolutely opposed to ending involvement, unilateral exit. Appreciate that. Um, if you look at the cost recovery model mm -hmm. and it gets to a point where um, you see the numbers there of, of the increased fees. Um, the, the reality there is it could get to a situation where the, the fee structure is too high that families can't um, participate in that, therefore potentially resulting in an exit, right? If the program can't run the way it is. So I, I, I totally get that your position A is this, but I just want to be, be clear, yeah. the thinking as you've thought through this, um, you know, by, by increasing it, if, if we take option A from you know, essentially mm -hmm. 1,000 to 1,400 bucks a month, you know, whether you got one or two kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's significant, and, and uh, um, I'll say my piece in a second, but a, a, that potentially could lead to an exit. I just want to make sure that, that mm -hmm. we're upfront on that, and if, we're, if you're okay with that, uh, and I'm not saying that's where you want it to go, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to make sure that's there, and maybe you don't need to answer that. I just wanted to maybe a statement, so you don't have to reply. It's okay. Um, so it's okay. That's 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 what we talk as much as we do, because I know that, that curveball was coming, so that's okay. Uh, I'm fine with that, totally. Um, at the end of the day, I would be regretful if a parent in this room or a parent who's not in the room with a child or children in our program and the fees are up by 10% and our costs came down by 10% to close this gap to zero subsidy, which by the way will satisfy 62% of the entire population of Beaumont saying, I'm okay with if, if the city runs a daycare, sorry, early child learning facility. Good catch. Uh, thank you. Uh, and has no subsidy, they're fine with it. I'm fine with it as well too. You know? that, that, so let me let me answer your question because the parents deserve an answer. So do my fellow counselors. I would be very regretful if a parent had to leave the program because the cost went up by 10%. They could no longer afford it. Uh, that was not be my intention, but the subsidy is is treating a small part of the population a little bit advantageously, advantageously. Pardon me. And a lot of people I know. Some, in the, some parents in the, in the program, many aren't, think a subsidy is not what we should, we should be doing. Okay. And I, but I don't want to have the program go away. I'm very adamant about that. So to answer your question, I would hope to have a parent not have to leave the program, but with the people on the waiting list, I think the program would remain intact from that perspective. But I would apologize to that parent who had to leave financially. I, w I would regret that, but yes. there's tough choice we have to make. And that's why we're in these chairs. And I would regret that, but the subsidy in my mind needs to go away and the program has to has to stay the program has to be strong and has to be supported thank you through the parents and because it is a program it's a great program and it costs a little bit more than other places and that's the choice our parents are making and I, I applaud them for that okay thank you um, Councilor Barnhart thank you follow that up <laughs> it's getting tougher and tougher yeah <laughs> people like go last it's, it's so many things coming in tough discussion tough tough decision making and I understand we're not there yet. Uh, three points that I that I always go back to for our quality childcare or for running a childcare program: affordability, accessibility, and quality. I think we've got two out of three there. No, no doubt in my mind that we're we're looking at options here for more accessibility. And I'm I'm leaning towards option two, the presented by the consultant. Uh, I like the idea of expansion. I think our economic uh, 
as the mayor has said, our, our economic priority definitely speaks to the need for more child care spaces. Quality, we definitely have the quality. I want to keep that quality. However, the affordability has got me very concerned. Um, I think if we continue on, and I, I, I do like what you're saying, Councilor Dalla, about the cost uh, recovery, but I just don't think it's possible to maintain the quality given the, the direction we're going. Our cost as a civic service and civic employees is going to keep going up. That's not going to go down. I think we need to look at a different governance model, different uh, service delivery model, and that's where I think the, the parent-run nonprofit is the way to go. Community-run, it doesn't have to be only parents, it can be community. I'm more in favor of developing our own than I am of us handing it over to another nonprofit, because I do know a lot about the nonprofit world, and I do know that bigger, bigger organizations are going to come to us and expect us to adopt their ways, and I think our ways have a lot in, uh, a lot going for them. So I'd like to maintain our way. I think our Beaumont program is, uh, is uh, bar none, the best in the province, maybe in Canada. And, I, and I'd like to see us, I, I think you've put a challenge out to us, um, whether or not you can live up to that challenge in terms of coming back with a transition plan, I don't know. But I'd like to try. And I don't want the uncertainty to continue, but I also don't want to look a gift to us now. I think there's an opportunity there. And uh, we've done a lot of investing in our economic development strategy. I'm going to say we didn't blink an eye, maybe we blinked one eye, um, on uh, putting $200,000 towards a project. I think this is a project that's worth an investment. So I think it's a challenge. Can, I'm up for it. Can I, can I just be clear? You said option two. Um, so, the, so the recommendation came The recommendation came with kind of that hybrid approach of option 2A and 2B. I'm just, I'm just curious, like, are you, do, do you like the model that they're thinking as let's, let's see if we can get to that unilateral piece or do you want to see us, let's aggressively go out and, and spend some um, capital to, you, to your point to go and try and find that, that community partner? I think developing a nonprofit community developing partner non would invest. We have to invest in that. We could not do that with existing people right now. Okay. It's very, very difficult. Very difficult to get even a nonprofit group that is bound and determined to do things like some of the ones we're working with. It, you have to invest. You have to give them community development support. I would invest because I think our kids are good. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Stout. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to clarify, what is the question that I'm actually asking, answering here? I beg your pardon. Yeah, no, fair. Um, um, so the question is not, uh, if you if you choose to um, pick an option, that, that's up to you. I'm not asking you to pick that option. Um, uh, some Thank folks you. have. Um, I'm not. If you don't, if you're not in position to right now, then that's totally fair as well. I'm asking you to to provide a summary of your thoughts, the discussion we've had today, and some potential next steps. Good. Thank you for clarifying, um, and I'm happy to do that. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think I can pick an option at this point because um, I should have asked for more information and for more study and reporting, unfortunately, even though I don't want to kick this down the road any more than absolutely necessary, but it is important that we reach the right answer for the right reasons. Um, first thing, we've been asked um, a couple of times, are we in or are we out? Uh, I don't think I've really heard anybody answer that. From my perspective, we are already in. Um, We're in right so now. the question then becomes: Stay in. Stay in, or we do, do we stay, stay in, in or, or, or do we get out? Um, I'm certainly not in favour of getting out if that means we, we built what's. Yeah, well, there's no question what's what's obviously seen as an outstanding program. Um, so I'm no question of get. There's no. I'm not in favour of getting out if that means destroying or losing that program completely and, and so that's not an option for me. Um, the next question that comes up was, was one of, of universality is can we make this available to everybody who wants and needs it. I think that would be the gold standard. I'd love to achieve that if we can and I'd certainly like to investigate the opportunity to do that if, if it exists and, and my, my chief concern with that is that the, 
it's likely to come with a heavy price tag that we may not be able to afford as a municipality. Um, but I don't know that's the case. So that's one of the options I'd like to investigate and, and try and get some sort of cost attached to that. And, um, the, the, the drawbacks have already been alluded to of, of, of going along the route that's recommended in terms of this, this doesn't give us um, predictability or reliability or how, whatever we're going to call it. Certainty, let's say. Um, <clears throat> the economic benefit arguments that have been made, um, to me, actually don't cut a lot of, <laughs> of um, don't carry a lot of weight for me because we're not doing this for the economic benefits. There may be, and we can certainly argue that there are economic benefits to running this program, but that's n and, and that's great. But, but those are. Those are side issues. That's not the reason we're doing this. Um, there's, you know, if we were to take a, a completely economic view of this, then we'd say, well, what's the most? What gives us the most economic benefit for providing a, a, for providing services? Well, it, it might not be this. Certainly, I can I can think of other um, areas that the municipality spends money where there might be an even higher return. So. Logically, that's what you do. It, it, so I'm not suggesting that, by the way. This is this is simply that the economic benefits are, are subsidiary. That's that's not why we're in this game. If we are in this game, which we are. Um, so if we can't provide universality at a, at a price that we can afford, then what does that leave us with? That leaves us, I think, going towards the cost recovery model. Uh, back towards the cost recovery model. Um, You've already so I'm, again, I, I um, and and the reason I do that again is not because I don't want to spend this money. It's because there's a question of equity, which is that um, why are we subsidising some people to to um, some of our residents to uh, to partake of a daycare system, um, but not others? Why are we subsidising the parents of 78? Children or whatever the number was, was seventy-eight, wasn't it? And not the other five hundred or six hundred that may also require that service. Um, that to me is iniquitous. So my, my ways of fixing that would be: well, we either remove the subsidy altogether by um, by by adopting a full cost recovery model or trying to move towards that, and you uh, or we find or we provide a subsidy for everybody or everybody who needs it. So maybe, and it's alluded to in this report, and you suggested the question was, well, suppose we can't get to full cost recovery without making the service unaffordable, which I think might be a, a possibility. It's another one that I need more information on so that I can come to some sort of answer. But then in that case, my attitude is, well, maybe we have to means test, as, as the report alludes to, and so that we can ensure that the people who really need that service uh, that cannot afford it are, are subsidized, and that the people who can afford it and need it are perhaps not. Okay. So I'd like more information on that option. Too. Okay. No, I, I got that. I got no follow-up questions for you, sir. Um, I'll, I'll move forward to, to Councillor Van Newkirk. Sounds good. So yeah, there's been a lot said tonight. Um, I'll probably piece together a few of my thoughts that I've put together kind of throughout the night. Uh, first off, I want to acknowledge that we're we're here because of um, questions that were asked, um, questions we've asked, and questions that have been asked of council. And uh, as Councillor Monkoff Swain has alluded to, that this council hasn't shied away from tough discussions and tough decisions. And uh, uh, it won't start with this one for myself. So. Um, Earlier, I said that uh, you know the discussion is whether we're um, in or out of childcare, and I, I like the way it was corrected by Councillor Barnhart to say whether we stay in or get out, because that's actually the, the question. And I haven't heard that all the way answered around the table. Uh, I kind of have, but you know, um, haven't. Uh, the predictability piece is, is of high high importance to myself. Um, you know, the conversation has started once again. Uh, very much respect the words of well, most of. Uh, most of the words of Councillor Hendricks around the whole piece where you've been here before, that other discussions have got here before, and then it's like, oh, but it fizzled out, and you know, we, we really want to take it up, take it beyond that. Then I continue with the rest of the words um, around looking at um, the line items and um, 
what Councillor Hendricks has explained tonight, I have great interest in as well, which is how did we get here? Um, you know, the, there was a service put in for all the right reasons, and it got to this point for all the decisions that were deemed right at the time. But here's here 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 we are with a large subsidy, um, de what we've deemed to, to be a large subsidy affecting a small group. That's the perception. Now I put a huge value in uh, the the comments in here around the tough to uh, quantify one dollar six dollar paragraph that was indented here. Um, you know where it says basically uh, the report finds that for every one dollar spent on the expansion of early childhood education services, we realize almost six dollars in economic developments. When we're talking about kids and little minds, we got one shot. And that's how, that's how I look at it with my kids. You got one shot to get it right, and you're trying to do everything right. And I think this council is trying to trying to get this as right as possible. There's not going to be a, a, an answer that's going to help every, or it's going to help everyone. And there's not going to be an answer that's going to make everyone make everyone happy here. Uh, I have concern with the finding or creating of partners, um, and I've said that once tonight, and I'll say it again. Um, well, I very much like the idea of creating a partner and creating a nonprofit. I very much am skeptical of the ability, not because of people's abilities, because of group ability and individually people's abilities to stay on and keep going. Um, we've set high standards in this council and in, in Beaumont. And you set something up and you've, you've, we've put the bar here and we've put the bar here with this program, we've put the bar here with management of budgets for construction. We've put the bar here for storm removal. It's up in cul-de-sac. We've, we've raised the bar high and finding the partners that are going to come in and work with us or that we create that are going to continually keep that bar high. I, I have concern with that. Uh, I very much uh, enjoy your, you know, your comments around the, um, the third parties, the YMCA boys and girls clubs. And then, um, and then just deflated a bit when you, you know, when the reality check of but they're going to come in with their own policies and procedures and they're going to end up doing their own thing. Yep. Wah, wah, wah. Oh, oh goodness. So then I look, you know, again back to why did we get into this discussion? We got into the discussion because of budget talks and a line item. And then we we get to a point where it's like, okay, what are we going to do? So um, for myself, I got a, I got a green flag on the um, the option one in the, in the cost recovery looks. And uh, the the figure five where you have the fifty dollar, hundred dollar, one fifty, you got to start with something. You got to start with some numbers, right? And I, and I very much respect how you yep. go up there. Is you know you could have chose thirty, sixty, ninety. Absolutely. Or you could have chose seventy five, one fifty, two twenty five. But you know you chose you chose some numbers there and put it in. But um, I think Councillor. Um, Dan Luck, uh, you know, his words are on regretting if things were to change in here that it would affect families and they not be able to come in, I would, I would fall in that camp as well. And going darn near last, I get to reflect on all these points. Um, but uh, looking at what Councillor Barnhart said around the nonprofit gives us perhaps an, an opportunity and some additional funding. Um, so myself, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the cost recovery camp, uh, but with a caveat around being able to make good on some of that external funding, that that caveat may take us to a nonprofit in in my head, where we can get some more of those grants, have the have as simplistic piece set up as possible to be able to access those grants and then um, let it loose and back off. So if I had to say whether I was in or out, um, you know. I would be in the camp where I don't believe that it's municipality's responsibility anymore to provide um, the child care services, but I don't want to ever blow up or stop what we're doing right now. I'd like to look at um, some cost recovery pieces and I'd like to explore the external funding in the simplest way to, to get at that external funding so that we um, you know, can, can maintain what we have. Um, my closing comment is, is that if we can get to a spot where we are all, all, all children, um, based upon looking at the numbers Councillor Hendricks has put forward, based upon uh, pulling, as you call it, levers uh, in here. And, and <coughs> yeah, I, there's almost three pieces there for me that could come together to uh, you know, potentially uh, keep it alive and even expand it. So that's where I'm at.
Okay, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll try and summarize all that um, and weigh in my points as well sure. um, quickly because uh, I just should acknowledge that we've, we've been at this for two and a half hours, so thanks to the folks for sticking around with us and, and those watching in online. Um, appreciate you, you staying with us. Um, the first thing I'll say is um, thank you for the report. Um, I, I appreciate, you know, it's a tough job for a consultant to come in from the outside and, and sit down and chat with these parents um, and, and the, the public as well as staff and, and um, to, to get this input. Um, uh, with that being said, though, uh, I think it's, um, it's important for council that we make sure that um, we don't base our decisions on, on a report from uh, an external third party. I would like, uh, and so the one thing, the first recommendation that I'm going to have for um, administration is that we set up some conversations for the public um, to be able to have directly with with council. Um, I think that's an important step that we need to hear it. We need to hear the message directly, um, and so that is the first thing that I'll that I'll put forward on the table. Um, so, Mike, you're typing away frantically there, so we'll we'll, we'll address that in a second. Um, for, for me, um, I, I, uh, I think we, we, we got through a lot of content today uh, and I think we, we asked a lot of questions respectfully and um, so I wanted to thank our, our council members as well for, for going through um, having this respectful conversation and a challenging meeting. Um, I, uh, in terms of where, where I kind of sit, um, I, I would need to, like I said, have the conversations directly with, with residents. Um, I've, I've had some some conversations kind of informally in the background, um, but I'd like to see a formal process set up um, for us to be able to coordinate that through through the municipality um, so that we could um, standardize that um, and, and provide an opportunity, not just for parents, but for all members of the public to participate should they choose to. Um, I, uh, I also got um, hung up on this page here that's up on the screen with regards to the cost recovery. Um, I, I, I see the... Uh, um, the, the recommendation for me, I just can't get to where the mayor is um, in, in terms of um, the unilateral space without impacting the, the budget. So, my my two my thoughts on this is I, I would uh, I'd love to get there. Um, that's why I'd, I'd like us to go and, and explore that a bit more um, and, and find some more information about what we think that potential cost could be, what, how, how we could get there. I think it's worth going into our planning department to look at the land use bylaw. It's worth looking at economic development to see are there any um, opportunities in there within our policies that could look at um, potential subsidizing of, of, um, of these facilities in terms of their, um, their mill rate and that sort of thing. So I'd, I'd like us to, to look into that. Um, I can't, uh, I, I don't have enough here in front of me to be able to, um, to be able to move ahead with this one just because I, I can't see the end goal. I, I never want to make a decision where I don't know what the cost impact is going to be and, and um, respectfully, we haven't got that in front of us. So I, if I was to summarize, um, the, the cost recovery model is important. I, I would like to be able to sit down and have an honest conversation with, um, with parents, with the public about, about those three options, about the, what the impact would be to a 50, 100, 150. I'd like to hear from... Um, you know, Ms. Williston, after you've had a chance and your, your department has had a chance to digest the conversation here today about thoughts around this. Um, so um, for me, yeah, I'd like to, um, I'd like to get that, that conversation more formally um, uh, uh, off the ground. Um, so in, in terms of next steps, um, Mr. Schwartz, um, step one, uh, do we, I don't know if we need to vote or not, but um, my, my first comment around let's set up that process um, maybe go around the, do we need to go around the room, nods of heads, is it a motion? You tell me you're the process, well you're not the process guy, but yeah, <laughs> you're right. supposed to be the process supposed guy. supposed to be the process guy. So do we need to make a motion just to... to a suggestion I'll throw out is, is let's have a discussion and get agreement on the direction you're, you're proposing on. Okay. Let's see what the rest of council says. And then what we'll do is get the nuances of those, both Clemens and myself and Kim have been taking notes and, and I'll read them back to you and then we'll end it with a an overarching motion that will direct it back to the administration based on the factors that you okay. need to do. So you want to go out to the public, why don't you test that with your fellow councillors and see okay. where that goes. And so the, the premise of it is obviously um, Clemens and team has done a great job going out to the public. I just think we need to be able to hear directly from folks on this. Um, thoughts from people around the room, anyone opposed to that? Maybe I'll put it that way. Opposed? Absolutely not. In fact, I thought we promised it. 
So I, I did bring it up at a previous meeting, and the, the feedback that I got from people was bring it forward at this meeting. So that's what I'm bringing it forward at this meeting. Um, I assume <coughs> your hands are not up because you're opposed to it. You just want to say something? Yeah, just comment. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Be careful. No, yeah. <laughs> no. um, so, yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, there's been quite a process where you've talked to a whole bunch of groups and, and what you heard from the parents was digested down into three quarters of a page. Um, and what I haven't seen a whole bunch in here, we did have the public survey, uh, but it's hard to understand where those responses came from. So I think from, from my side, that's why I would support another, another direct chat. And, uh, and I think we would need to really make sure that um, this is a chat with Walmart. This is a chat with both sides of the fence. Uh, this is a big a chat with with everyone, so that you know I would support that. Okay, thank you, Council Barnard. Just, just concern about the timing. June is almost done. July not a good time for that. September, when parents need to know that they have childcare for the next year. So I'm just a bit concerned about that. What did you have in mind? Sorry, fair. Um, I, I certainly wasn't um, thinking that we would make any decision that impacted the September timeframe. Um, and I think we need to be absolutely clear on that now. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but nothing that we're doing here um, is going gonna, is gonna to change here for... The, the point is that January is not a good time for child care people to change child care either. It's usually a September to June kind of period. I, I get the window. So I, I'm in the I window. Think we're kind of <laughs> pushing it off, which is back to the certainty. But I'm, I'm fine with that. I think we need to write not fast. Yep. So I would I would suggest I wouldn't be supportive of something changing in January either. No, no, I agree. I think um, as a discussion, we, we should come to a consideration that um, the discussion that we're having here today doesn't impact the, the 2020 budget. It's the September 2020 cycle going forward. Um, so that, that gives the, for lack of a better term, certainty for this year. Um, and, and apologies if that wasn't clear. I thought that was always the intention. Um, but. Um, do we do we any concerns around that? That you know we're not um, without obviously budget time is is, is uh, coming up in October ish, um, but to, to Council Barnhart's point there, any any opposing comments on that? No. Okay. So to to be clear, um, the review that we're looking at here does not. Uh, it, it, it does not impact. Uh, I know the 2020 budget consists of partial of that, and within September, so we might we might look at that by September um, for 2020. Yes, yeah, but you can manage that. Yeah. I Go ahead. want to ask a clarifying question on on what going back to the public looks like, so that everybody at yep. this table can weigh in or, or, or say no. Yeah. So. I mean, this is dangerous territory because I, I would love to jump in here and, and provide my piece. I don't know if it is my job to, to tell you how to run the communications. <laughs> That's not what I'm asking. At the level of okay. Yeah. My understanding of what we'll go back to the public with is essentially a rolled up version of this report. Yeah. That okay. Will show sure. all I'll of summarize the options that. and say what do you think? But we'll set it up in a formal. Yeah. Uh, so for for me, there are really the two options. I think only um, Councillor Barnhart mentioned the. Um, the community nonprofit piece. I think a few other folks um, weren't interested in that. Um, so I think um, I, I don't think that's worth looking at based on the numbers around here. Um, I think it's the two options of um, the unilateral piece. How do we get there from a financial perspective, uh, and then the cost recovery um, model and, and, and those can options. I that yeah, I really can I, yeah. don't think that's fair. Yeah, I'd like to go out with what we have. My point. My point being is uh, that. If there aren't four votes for that, well, what's the point in, in, in going down that well, road? I'd like to hear what the citizens are. Well, I, yeah, and I would like, mm. I'm sort of in Councillor Barnhart's camp. I think that's one of the models you get re, we need, that need to be looked at to get to that universal care, of care. I don't think you can exclude it from the discussion with the community. Because about part of that expansion and, and keeping the program intact and doing that is, is going to be, I think that's an option that's worthwhile and worth looking at. Let's hear what others have to say. Councilor Van Newkirk? Yeah, I think that uh, the answer to this is going to be paramount so that we're not sitting here in six months having the exact same discussion again, right? And uh, the, the spirit, I think, of what you're asking is, okay, there's been a discussion, there's been a, a draft report pr presented, there's been a discussion at this table, there's been a whole bunch of people who have had a lot of patience, thank you everybody, uh, for the discussion tonight. Um, and uh, what do you think now? Is kind of is that is that what you're what you're wondering? And so, what do you think now, given all of this? Um, and 
I'm not Mr. Schwartz for a succinct way to do that that doesn't <coughs> facilitate a redo of this conversation. I, I, I don't know how to do that. The, the dilemma we face here is we're in a committee, uh, we're not making motions, we're not effectively making decisions on any one of these options. Uh, I don't know how you can exclude one then because you haven't received any input from anybody. That's what you're after. If you're after a broader set of input from the, from the entire community, I don't know how you can, uh, unless you can agree unilaterally here that option four is, is not, not worth pursuing. I, I didn't hear anybody well, get to that point yet. I think it, would, it would be nice if we could eliminate one, that would be helpful. Yeah, so to, to Councilman Newkirk's point, that was the intent is that ideally today we, we read all the options down to what council is comfortable with, go out to the public. Um, but to, to your point, we're not going to get to a uni unilateral piece. Um, and so adding that extra step um, is, uh, uh, you know, obviously we're not going to get there. So essentially the direction then is to facilitate a conversation around the options that were presented. Um, hopefully there is an opportunity to get more information on, on the, the numbers for around the recommendation uh, and then go out and have that conversation. And if you're looking for feedback on specifically how to do that, come, you know, how to get hold of me. Say a little bit, just re really quickly, I think we're there. Uh, say a little bit more about more on the numbers for each of the options. No, more more on the numbers for the, the, the recommendation in front of us where we, we look to expand with partners. We look to unilaterally cover the 600, call it 600 spots. Um, the mayor indicated that it would be great if we could get there without spending a, a cent, and I think we're all there. I just can't, I, I need to be able to see more information about how we get there. Um, how we get there, what, what the cost impact is to, to get there. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not saying that we should unilaterally do 600 spots. I'm saying that we should explore some options. Please don't be putting those words on. Okay, so, okay. Okay. Is, that, is that, Clemens, is that clear what, basically your recommendation, but cost it out, right? Like how, how can we, I can't see, and the report doesn't show me how we can go from looking after X amount of spots, increasing those spots, but not increasing the cost. I, I just don't know how we do that. And, and yes, there's there's the partners piece, but if the city is still involved at that point, surely our overhead um, and some of our direct costs go into that. So that that's what I would like to see come back out of it. I, I think it's a timeline as well. I mean, part of this is how many years does it take us to get to that point? Bingo. And so there you go in terms of how much money. Well, that's another question I got too. It doesn't have to happen in one year. Councilman Newkirk. And I know there's uh, three votes are on the table for a numbers breakdown, Mr. Mr. <laughs> numbers breakdown guy. So, uh, but uh, just looking for uh, if, as part of this conversation, we're going to be able to get a numbers breakdown that Councillor Hendricks was looking for, uh, because I think when we need to compare some of those costs across both sides of the fence. So. Yeah. While we're adding things, if any more information on the one dollar equals six can be added in terms of social return on investment. If we're going to go that road, I want to go that road. Yeah. So, in, so it's important. Yeah. And so in terms, absolutely. So in terms of process, um, looking for the city to set up um, some direct engagement opportunities for council to meet with the public regarding those options, but ultimately bringing back the report to a council meeting for a decision after that process, and then council, the city would summarize that feedback. We'd obviously take our own thoughts around that but then ultimately picking a date on the calendar and making the decision. What's okay. a reasonable timeline for uh, that to occur? Well, going back to Councilor Barnhart's very obvious observation, that the summer's not time to do this. You just bought yourself until, you know, really the spring to make that decision, although that'd be pretty tight if you were looking at to do something in 2020. Uh, I'd say late fall that we'd be prepared to come back on November summer timeline. Mm -hmm. In the, that in the public piece completed. Yeah, that was the other question. Yes, and, and put a decision in front of them. Okay, so Council. we could have a course forward by the end of the year. Is that where timeline we're sort of sitting on? Course forward at the end of the year for the September 2020 starting. Potentially. Yeah, we'll see what comes out of it. Yeah, there's still a bunch of information that needs to be gathered and given. So. Okay, Councilor Allen. If I may, Mr. Chair, um, I agree with what we just said a moment ago. I would like to ask Council to consider one thing, and that is, would be to drop the end in involvement 
universal exit from the discussion. Um, I got the impression from our discussions, no one's at this table in favor of that last option. When that option first came out in our discussion way back when, social media had its own way of doing things. Many parents became fixated on the fact that council is going to kill the program. Uh, that's not what we're talking about this evening, if I'm wrong, correct me. I think taking out the option of universal exit now sets the stage that the parents know that we are committed to the program, whether we take the option of the recommendation to phase out over time. But by taking this out off the table right now, it tells our community that we're not simply killing, killing the program that many people in the community felt we were going to do erroneously, but nonetheless that perception is out there. And I think taking it off the table right now would not do us any harm. I personally don't feel that way. Sorry. Right. But I'm also prepared to leave it there and <clears throat> strongly. It is an option that's been presented, as Mr. Schwartz said. It's presented, you really can't take it away, but I, I think confidently we could take it away. So by and doing, send a strong message that. By, by doing that, you're saying that we are staying in. Staying in, either under cost recovery or under the recommendation, the recommendation model, which take us a number of years to be stepping out from. So I guess what I'm saying, I want, I want to give, I, I'm, I think we can give the parents some level of confidence that the idea of, of universal exit is not on the table, period, going forward. I, um, so uh, I don't discount a word you just said or the applause that just happened, but I think from a, a responsible decision-making perspective, anytime you take a decision off the table and say you're not going to do something, and then it, we go down a path, and that comes back on the table. What was the harder decision to make? To make it's a it's an easy decision to make that tonight and say we're not going to do that. But there's a whole bunch of discussion and information that we just asked for again that may lead us down a path to get to there. And then someone needs to raise their hand and say, I think we need help <coughs> if, it, if it gets to that point. So, um, so I was the one at the beginning of this whole discussion that said. Uh, because this is how it started, right? When we had the box up on the screen, and I, I raised my hand and I said, yeah, I know, and I don't want that either. But responsibly, when you're making a decision, you, if you take something off the table, it's off the table. And, uh, you know, and it was only about a meeting later where it's back on the table and it was on a report. So it's not where I think we should go either, but I think in, in a just responsible decision-making piece, that's how we got to here, so I, I, I wouldn't, see why we would need to change that. It, you know, you saw which sections were thick in here, which sections weren't, <laughs> right? So that's just my thoughts on the topic. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, I wasn't successful at narrowing it down. So if we're not gonna narrow it um, for one, we should just keep all options. Um, I think your intent is absolutely right, um, but I think keep the options flowing. So based on those two comments, I withdraw my request. Okay, um, just to be, to be clear, when we're talking about engagement, we're talking, uh, I am talking, and I hope other, one, other folks are following along. This isn't asking the city to go out and conduct more engagement on your own on the outside. This is direct a chance for parents to sit down, sorry, the public to sit down with council directly. I don't want to go through and repeat the same process that's already gone on. You've, you've had a great survey that's gone out, all that sort of stuff. That's not what we're looking for. We're wanting to facilitate a process that we get to hear directly. Thank you. Some town halls or things. Yeah. And that's not disagreed by anybody or not? No. Yeah. 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 Sorry, what's not disagreed? That, that, that this is a public engagement <laughs> opportunity to sit down with council. Yes. Town, yeah, hall, town, hall, town hall. Town hall. Town hall. <clears throat> We're not going to get into specifics because I'm, I'm yeah, ready we're, to go. We're not. Yeah. We're okay. Not let's let's wrap this up here. Um, so, yeah. You, then. yeah you, if you've got a motion, with those things considered, uh, and I've got six, at least six items of information that will come back. Uh, the, the motion I throw out, ask you to throw it on the table, is that the committee of the whole receive the phase two child care services report as information and refer matters to administration for review and bring back to council for approval. What's the six things you're doing? Six, six what items is, yeah. I've got that is to set up the uh, the uh, town hall, for lack of a better term, the public uh, interaction or uh, engagement. Uh, more numbers on how we got to the expand with partners option, uh, what those numbers could look like, increasing the spots to be able to provide universal. Uh, more information on the $1 equals six investment topic. Uh, decision to bring it back to the regular council late in the fall, so that's just a decision that's part of the motion. And then that's it, sorry, that was over five. The last one was a drop, but you didn't agree that. So moved. And 
if you need to move. Uh, the number breakdown. From oh, and the, yeah, the yes. Form, right? Oh, I included that in number one. You're right. How we got here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm I'm happy with that. Does someone want to move that motion? So, uh, yeah. Take one. <laughs> oh, the mayor made the initial notice of motion, so he, he can uh, he can take this one. So that motion um, on the floor, call the vote. Aye. That is approved. That is passed unanimously. Sorry, we're getting late. Um, so let's take a five minute break yeah. and That's thank you folks.
decides they want to prove their worth by driving. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think the entire region emptied out on the streets today. Burning right. all okay. the carbon. Call, I'll call the meeting back to order. Um, please note that the that uh, the chair, uh, Councilor Margot Swain, had to leave. So please note that I will be taking over the chair of the chair of the meeting, which brings us back to item number three A, Edmonton Global. So I believe we have Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and Councilors, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you this evening. Um, I will take about 10, 12 minutes to actually present and then I'm happy to answer any questions. And I think before I start, I just want to congratulate you for your ongoing participation at the regional level in all things that you do, because it's an important dynamic and I think will really bode this region well, particularly as we're transitioning through a number of things as we, as we go on. Uh, I think also importantly that you'll find that the work that you are doing creating this regional culture is also benefiting across a broad spectrum of activities, not just economic development. And I think that's really where, you know, I continue to see uh, the advantage that we have. And I will tell you right now that I just got a report in from Manitoba and from Bahrain Palliser, the premier there, and basically indicates, and we need to follow the example of the Edmonton Metropolitan Region, quote unquote, when it comes to things like economic development. So nice. it is being noticed elsewhere in the country of the, the collaboration and the, and the outcomes that are being achieved by this organization. So, and I mean, we, the region as the organization. So I just congratulate you for that ongoing work. And I also love to highlight the fact that you are equal owners in Edmonton Global, <laughs> right? right? So that's an important thing that people need to understand that you are one of 15 that are co-owners regardless of size, scale or scope. So I think that's an important notion. So Edmonton Global was, I think I had, there we go. Okay, Edmonton Global started as an idea, a concept that 15 member municipalities making up the Edmonton metropolitan region could do more to attract investment and build a stronger, more robust economy by working together and acting more strategically. We shared a belief in what could be possible for our region and a commitment to come together for the good and future prosperity of our community. From our memorandum of association, it, this is what you as a shareholder group created Edmonton Global to do on your behalf. One, to advance economic development and cooperation in and among stakeholders located in the Edmonton Metropolitan Region, consistent with the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Growth Plan. Two, to promote the Edmonton Metropolitan Region globally to attract and retain business investment in the region. Three, to pursue regional brand, database, and economic development <coughs> strategy. Well, excuse me. Four, to advocate at the local, provincial, and federal levels for policies that remove barriers to economic development in the region. And five, to pursue business and investment opportunities to support the region. Much of our work over the last six months, and indeed this past year, has been in the organizational startup phase. And we've been working to create the conditions and the foundation that will position Edmonton Global for long-term sustainable uh, success. Now the real work begins. Edmonton Global has roughly three years to prove our value to the region. What matters now is we wrap our heads around this transition point from planning to doing. This does not mean we'd be being idle, quite the opposite. Uh, for example, over the last 16 months, Edmonton Global took a leadership role in partnership with Edmonton Economic Development Corporation, the Government of Alberta, and Western Economic Development as part of the headquarters and a major investment attraction program. And our efforts generated $74.5 million in economic impact based on a reported value of 29 deals and generated nearly 200 jobs reported by the companies that were aided by the program. We've also worked up lining up the federal, or sorry, funding to ensure the organization is sustainable. And as each of you know, each municipality has made this initial three-year commitment to operational funding. The government of Alberta has also come to the table in a big way. And in February, the government of Canada, through the Western Economic Development Diversification, announced a $2.3 million uh, funding grant uh, of federal money. Having stable funding for the next three years is a major milestone. So strategies are being developed right now to engage the private sector uh, for investment into Edmonton Global in the near future. To deliver the scale, the impact we expect, having sources of funding in addition to the public support will be critical. And part of this funding, I will say to you quite happily that it's uh, allowed me to actually hire a team. Um, so we now have 
uh, in the leadership realm, Lee Mello leading the investment and trade division, Lynette Tremblay leading the strategy and innovation division, and Chris Malo, or, or McLeod, sorry, leading our communications and marketing efforts. If you think about the region as a product that we are selling to investors, Lee's team identifies and builds in relationship with customers with the goal of driving sales. Lynette and her team are improving the product which we're selling through advocacy, innovation, and partnership. And Chris works on the awareness packaging and growing our customer base. We've completed a series of sectorial deep dives in our focus sectors, energy, health, food and ag, and manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, and a benchmarking scorecard with a special lens on artificial intelligence and high tech. So this is what's been completed to date. Right now our team is actively working on establishing a compact with your municipal and economic development partners across the region. It is a type of code of conduct or guide our collective efforts as we work together, as well as lead share protocols. This compact will be agreed to and signed off by each of your CAOs and your economic development teams. Uh, right now I'm just getting the final bits of it and I'm really looking forward to getting this off because this helps create that regional culture I spoke about earlier. The process of creating a re compelling regional narrative is well on its way. Uh, this will all help us share the story of Edmonton metropolitan region within the world. And we're planning a public launch, as many of you are aware, on the 20th of June for those that can make it, and I encourage you to try and be there. Uh, I think you'll find that it's, uh, it's a very uh, good story uh, and one that I think will resonate uh, on a global marketplace. So a study recently completed on our four focus, uh, our four focus sectors identified, Edmonton Globals, identified in the Edmonton Global Strategic Plan where agribusiness, health, energy, and manufacturing is noted. It highlighted the strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats, as well as export market analysis for subsector opportunities within these sectors. This report has been distributed to your economic development team and the regional economic development agencies as part of the economic development network. A key theme woven throughout the report was the importance of innovation for driving competitiveness and growth across all sectors. Each sector was unique. Uh, each sector has unique growth potential and opportunities for export development, but also faces a series of growth barriers. Some of the challenges to innovation and expansion across multiple subsectors include regulatory barriers, which are not a surprise to many, the lack of access to capital, the lack of scale up infrastructure, lack of connectivity, and a general lack of competitiveness in the business, uh, regional business environment. After assessing our strengths and weaknesses uh, were at the sectorial level, we set out to compare our region to other jurisdictions globally through a benchmarking scorecard. A steering committee was assembled with the guidance of the Conference Board of Canada. They selected 21 other jurisdictions to compare ourselves against in three categories, the economy, competitiveness, and social using 44 separate um, indicators across the three categories. Jurisdictions were indexed to account for size and scale and given a letter grading for each of the indicators and categories. And you'll see why we had to adjust for scale when you look at the list. Now, if you note on this list, there are many of those that are in the top that we actually uh, spoke to when we were building Edmonton Global because they do create some best in practices, but you'll also note the Netherlands are there as well as Scotland. Scotland is very similar to us. And the Netherlands, believe it or not, fits in the same corridor between Edmonton and Calgary. And there's 17 million of them in there. But they get, they attract four FDI dollars for every one that we attract. And they have no natural resources. So everything they import, they value add, it ship out. So when we talk about best in class, the Netherlands is one of those countries that is best in class in terms of value adding all their processes. So overall, Edmonton Global ranked 13th out of 22 jurisdictions, basically in the middle of the pack. On the economy, this category was our lowest ranking with 19 of 22, or a D grade overall. Granted, some of this is due to the fact that we're still climbing out of a recession, but it also highlighted some of the structural deficiencies in our economy and the need to be addressed through to become more resilient. One of the ways to address this is to increase our value-add economic activities uh, so that we're less susceptible to the commodity market uh, fluctuations. In competitiveness category, we finished 12th of 22, or a C overall. 
we definitely have some competitive problems to address before we can realize our growth potential in the region. Our advocacy efforts need to be focused on improving our low competitive scores and maintaining our advantages like low electricity rates. Finally, in the social category, which speaks largely to our quality of life, we scored very high, 5 of 22 or an A overall. We know this is a great place to live, but it also needs to be competitive for attracting jobs. And, and so while we enjoy a quality of life, it is attractive. Economy and competitive still rank in terms of importance to international investors. A special lens on artificial intelligence was included in the benchmarking study. And this entire study was also provided to all of our regional partners, so you do have access to the full report. This is complementary to the sectoral studies as we've identified AI and enabling technologies as horizontal sectors within our strategic plan. The key finding was that AI was a hopeful future in our region, both as an emerging cluster, but also in holding opportunities and benefits for improving productivity and innovation in our focus areas. Connectivity between all players and access to talent will also be key factors in establishing a globally competitive cluster here. So taking what we learned from the focus sector analysis and the benchmarking scorecards, we have now a significant growth potential throughout our four sectors. We know that we now have significant growth potential throughout our four focus sectors and in our horizontal sector of AI and enabling tech. But the growth potential is constrained by a lack of competitiveness. So we've assembled a regional advocacy team uh, to develop the recommendations of how to competitiveness and we're working through the regional businesses, municipalities, chambers of commerce and strong advocacy approach based on research clarity and unity of message and strength in numbers. Advocacy plan will be completed by the end of the summer and implemented collectively throughout the fall to impact cycle but also to impact obviously the federal election that will be coming up this fall. Thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Dr. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, Edmonton Global is really starting to get rolling and doing some great work. Uh, members of council for questions from Malcolm. I have a really quick one. Sure. So Gini coefficient is equality of pay between various sectors. So um, there is, yeah, so yeah, so that's, so if you have for um, ultra rich and ultra poor, you have a poor Gini coefficient. So if you have a, a in your in your pay scale between gap between the region. yeah and uh, so Canada ranks very high on Gini coefficient labor participation very high and female participation in the labor market ranks very high our productivity sucks but everything yeah. else is pretty good uh, <laughs> it's the name of the guy who developed the system Jimmy is the name of the guy Councilman there's a a new developing important conversation that has to do with a recent bill um, that I wonder when, when I saw that you were coming to visit I was like oh can't wait to ask uh, so bill seven yep. um, and where does that discussion go uh, how does it affect the you know what Eminent Global is doing um, you know the ability of you know municipalities to ratchet up and down um, and sway investment potentially one way or another um, when Edmonton Global is, you know, big picture about the region. So kind of a loaded question, but I don't know. I figured I'd throw it out there. Well, it's a good, it, I've been forewarned. So I, I, um, I, I think it's a very good one from a personal perspective, because I think that's important as well, just so you know. I, I'm, I don't think it's a good bill because it will race us to the bottom and potentially cause a hollowing out of infrastructure at the cost of short-term gains for long-term pain. And it won't be paid by us today will be paid by the lack of a pipe functioning properly in 10 years time because it should have been maintained five years ago but it hasn't been right because people are going to use cash to stay competitive with their neighbors when that money should have been rightly allocated to other things that said in this region I think there is a, actually a very positive uplift to it because this goes back to this culture of regionalism where I think the leaders of the region uh, in terms of the mayors and the councils all recognize that this would be a race to the bottom if we start. So some of that great collaboration that you've been working on right now is only going to be coming to the forefront now. Um, and I think the level of which it's where it's at is a 
level is tough. Uh, we just lost, well, I won't say we lost, there was an opportunity presented itself. In the end, we lost it to a U.S. state. Uh, a company's going to go spend $325 million. And the reason why, it's a Canadian company, and they're going to go build a facility down in the U.S. The build is going to be about $320 million. The U.S. incentive to build the plant there was $58 million. Worked out to 120 every person that was going to be employed in the plant. And it was mostly state incentives. So that's the reality of what we're trying to deal with. So, you know, if tax incentive for a couple of years is not going to be able to we need to figure out how we do it differently. And I say to you that, uh, first of all, we've got a collaborative culture that's just fantastic. We've got an immigration policy that's second to none, right? Like uh, a quality of life that's quite high. And if you think about the jurisdictions, well, you saw Austin, I think, is number one on this uh, list. But all those American companies or all those American facilities are up there, their education system is going in the tank. And yet we've got one of the best in the world from pre from pre-kindergarten up to PhD. So when you think about the future and you think about the talent pool that we're producing in Canada, in particular in Alberta, uh, we're gonna have a longer term, better future than what's going on now. And with things like immigration, we will keep graduates here for up to three years after they graduate. And if they want to stay, then they become landed immigrants. In the U.S. now, it's two weeks after graduation, you got to be out of the country. So when you talk on the tech side, for example, you're starting to see Iranians, Chinese, you know, a whole bunch of these workers are now coming to Canada, actually, because they don't want to go back to Iran. They'd rather stay in a nice country like Canada. And, uh, and so we're going to be able to capitalize on a lot of this talent being trained in other institutions as well to come here. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming and being patient with us. Uh, thank you for allowing discussion. me to yeah. be late. Plus, <laughs> it took some time. It was, it was, it was, it was a great discussion, and necessary. Um, a very selfish question might be: I know we're all very in favor of the original collaboration we're doing, and we're all on board with that. How do we make sure we get our fair share of the rewards of the efforts of Edmonton Global to bring? investment and jobs to this area? Like how do we make, how do we ensure we get our fair share of that? And maybe a bit of a loaded question and you can't answer it, I get it, but if you give me an idea how how we can ensure that we're a good partner and making sure we're getting our fair share of uh, opportunity to come to our specific municipality. Yeah, and I think, you know, there will always be a challenge in being able to tie, unless there's an announcement, to, to tie something directly back to say Beaumont, um, unless we can, because most of the, uh, uh, not most, a lot of what you're doing is really self-help, right? I mean, I look at what you're doing with the autonomous vehicle trials and you know the introduction of your community in a broader way, and that is going to help too. So it's really about a partnership of driving. Um, Robert Cotterall, who's retired out of the CAO of Spruce Grove, I think said it best to me, he says three years ago, he goes, like, I know our investment is X, 50 or $30,000, he goes, and I, I'm sure I'm going to be challenged to try and tie it directly back to the benefit. But I know collectively the region will benefit being able to sort of create a regional narrative. Because where we're getting killed is in market. In marketing? In market. Right. No, in market. So we did a reverse site selector. So site selectors are the folks that people hire, right, to try and find locations across the planet that meet certain criteria for their business decisions to, to decide where to invest. Mm -hmm. So we did a reverse site selector as part on top of this conference board report with eight, sorry, 22 different international site selectors across the planet. 82% of them came back and said, we've never heard of you. Like, I'm not talking about, we haven't heard from, but we know about energy. No, we haven't heard of you. So good news, bad news story is, you know, the bad news is they haven't heard of us, but the good news is we have no preconceived ideas to be able to change. And I think, I think what, are, what I think the vision for Edmonton uh, metropolitan region and the vision that has been set out by the leadership of this region is that we know there's another million people coming into this region. We know there's another 500,000 jobs. And I can tell you, Austin was not, the Austin of today was not the Austin of 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They had a shared vision 
that said we are fundamentally going to change. And the benefactors are not just the core city of Austin. It's all of the facilities that are now growing out. You know, a million square foot Amazon place, say. You know, some of the tech industries that's going on. I mean, I think their catch word is like, you know, we're, we're weird. I mean, that's, that's how they, they refer to Austin is. But that was set in motion 20 years ago. So when you look at the bold vision that the uh, both the shareholders and the board have committed to, which is a three to four percent GDP growth annually, that's three to four billion dollars a year. Now, on a five hundred or a hundred and five billion dollar growth, that that in and of itself over twenty years will fundamentally change what we are, and that means for all of us. So, it's not a it's a long answer to a direct question. I won't be able to tell you tomorrow unless there's a really direct, tangible benefit to Beaumont. But what you are contributing to is the greater good that will lead to all of us. Now, it may result in more residents for you, but you guys seem to be pretty good at attracting your own. <laughs> and uh, what you should also see from us is your economic development team should get busier. Like, if there's a real uptick, you should be you should be getting more. Like, so the leads that we send. And that's part of this investment readiness is how ready are our communities? And you're working on that already. And the image that you're starting to send is a very positive one, right? So, I mean, Beaumont is naturally going to be very attractive for many people, if not from a business perspective, from a residence perspective. But I think given your land, your proximity to the airport, knowing the expansion and the integrated supply chain here, I think there's a ton of opportunities that are going to land at your doorstep just because of who you are and where you are, to be honest with you. Um, some of the smaller communities like the Gibbons and the Bonacords, they're going to be challenged to turn around and for us to be able to say, you know, here's a direct impact, uh, unless there's growth in those areas, which is, which is where the industrial heartland is. Again, I know those long-winded yeah. answers, no, but no. I, uh, I just, well, I think it's important. Page, that all of us, I'm sure, yeah. on the same page. Yeah, you know, so the long answer is there's lots of exciting stuff going on in this room, and our act dev team is working really, really hard to position ourselves to be able to take advantage of everything Edmonton Global is doing and vice versa. So, yeah, it's just an exciting time to be part of this narrative right now. I think the commerce, like the air, the cargo and the e-commerce space is really going to be an explosive thing. You know, one of the things we found out for those that did know anything about us, remote and cold were the two kind of terms that came up pretty frequently. <laughs> But we're turning that into our advantage. You know, we're eight. We're 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 the closest major urban uh, metro region in North America to Asia. We are eight minutes farther down the sort of flight path from Anchorage, Alaska, where over a hundred cargo flights stop a day to refuel. Now, why would you go to Anchorage if you can come here, connect into an integrated supply chain system that is magnificent, right? Two railroads connect here, two sets of roads, the north, south, east, west, where access to ports. I mean, most people don't know that every single cherry basically out of BC and Washington gets shipped through EIA to Asia. Yeah. Like it's just every <laughs> single cherry. 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 Fresh fruit. Like cherry. cherry. <laughs> yeah. cherry. And they're because of the cold storage facilities that have been built by Rosenau out there, right? They're massive. For that, a quarter of that building is cold storage. So not only does it help on the fruit and food and beverage, but it's also going to help in all the medicinal sort of hemp and marijuana stuff that's going on. It's also helping in terms of pharmaceuticals because well, it's a massive, because it's all just in time delivery. And I will also say to you that we're talking right now with both DM of Ag, DM of uh, EDTT, I said that right, uh, and the airport, so Tom Ruth and I, about chill beef into Asia. And using EIA as that sort of first sort of uh, pilot for the rest of the, the province because of our proximity. I'm heading to Rupert to do some fishing, but I'm going to take half a day to uh, actually visit the whole port. Prince Rupert's the third busiest port. Mm -hmm. A container can get from Rupert to downtown Chicago in 80 hours. Best it can do in LA is, you know, 96 hours. Mm -hmm. And LA is. 68 hours farther steaming than Rupert is, and Vancouver's 36 hours farther steaming than Rupert is. The problem with Rupert is capacity. It's a deep water port, it's open all year round. We need to capitalize on it, right? Because that is, it, Asia is going to be a market for us. Maybe not China today, but China at some point, India for sure, 
uh, and Japan certainly and South Korea continue to be important markets for us. Exciting. I, 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 I think we're an eight cylinder engine firing on four right now and I just want to get it cranked <laughs> up, right? Like I really do. Like I just, I think that's what I, you know, I, I think we have it. I just think we got to get it done. And what's nice is, is these regulatory barriers that we have. I think if we are collectively saying, look, you need to change X, Y, and Z on the public policy rail, and there seems to be some appetite, at least provincially, for it, mm -hmm. I think we're going to go a long way. I mean, I know Councillor Hendricks has had some challenges opening businesses up here, and I, <laughs> and I swear to you, I'm going to try and reconcile that. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, he, he never does. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's a very exciting region. I mean, it really is. Yeah. We would Steve and I went to the uh, Edmund Chamber of Commerce Golf Tournament this past Thursday, representing our city, and we actually were recognized by the chair uh, as being present, and nobody else was. No city councilors from Edmonton, anywhere else. No mayors, nothing. We were there on behalf of our mayor and our council mm -hmm. too, us, but. I was quite actually proudly shocked that she made a point of saying we have two council city of Beaumont here. Thanks for coming and contributing to our day and being part of our region. This was there. That, that blew me away. It honestly did. No, nobody else, many other councils in the area were there. So. Well, the proof's in the pudding. You know, your growth rates are spectacular. You've got a big chunk of real estate you've now got that you can do some magnificent things and you've got proximity where most of the growth is starting to occur. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, and you've rebranded yourselves, you've recreated yeah, yourselves, right. which I think, you know, it looks, I, everybody's noticing it, right? So I, I think you're doing all the right things. And I, you know, I commend you on that because it, it's sometimes not easy because you have hard conversations you've just had for three hours, right? So it's about allocating resources for benefits and some are more tangible and immediate and it's tough. <laughs> to make some of those harder decisions where you may not see the return of investment tomorrow. Like the stuff we're into takes years to get done. Yeah. Years. Yes. And, 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 it's, and it's a painful process. But look at Montreal, they just, uh, they just won the best uh, Canadian city for FDI. They raised two and a half billion dollars of foreign direct investment last year. Mm -hmm. And they're being known as a tech hub. We produced over 537 AI specialists from masters and above. They produced 300. Yeah, they've got a they, because we haven't been telling our story, and we're going to we'll loud and proud, mm -hmm. and not an angry Albertan. I'll, I'll say it was <laughs> 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 yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, but you look at Kitchener Waterloo, right? They're dead, but part of that's because they're tech, right? They're tech heavy, and they've got a really good quality of life and location and things like that. So, um. And things like Gini coefficients and all these other things. So. Uh, maybe a junior question here on um, help me understand the Edmonton Global's role in something like um, collaborative facilities. Uh, you know, we're we're talking about you know FDI foreign direct investment and dollars and other people spending money in our region. Um, is there any mandate or room or conversation in Edmonton Global around? Uh, regional facilities and putting in towards a common goal for, you know, A, B, C, or D, uh, or is that outside of the, the mandate of the global? Yeah, so there, there's two components. One is that MRSP work that you're doing right now as part of the regional play, and then you're subsequently with some of the other folks, in particular on the bilats or the I can't remember IC, ICFs on uh, on recreation facilities. But the other larger question is about shared investment for shared benefit. So if you look at a place like Metro Denver, what they did, and we had the, we had uh, the, the, the number two from their econ regional economic development came up and talked a little bit about shared investment, shared benefit. Their method, their way forward was an infrastructure fund. And 40% of that and all net new assets went into an infrastructure fund. Within 10 years, they built out their complete LRT network right out to the county soon. Ten years built the whole thing out. That was where right? In Metro Denver. Metro Denver. Yeah. So they went out to counties that you wouldn't say, "What's an LRT line doing out there?" But it, but it, they got it done. In Minneapolis-St. Paul's case, the shared investment and shared benefit was triggered by the Mall of Americas. 
And uh, so all the surrounding municipalities said, look, at this mall of America is going to be a fundamental game changer on the economic development front. So they created a system that's more like a Canadian uh, you know, equalization system. 40 municipalities pay in, 40 municipalities draw out. So that was their shared investment for shared benefit. So I, for me, the, the, sh the long answer is we don't have a mandate in it, but we are obviously very interested in because the potential as an economic driver is critical. Mm -hmm. And I know the mayor and others are having very hard conversations at the, uh, the EMRB table. So the question mm -hmm. I always ask is, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Like, what are we trying to tackle? It was originally started around the airport court, or the airport itself, when it looked like potentially it was going to get annexed into the city of Edmonton. And so there was a concern about the Duke County losing that big driver in terms of economics. Uh, and since that annexation has now gone by the wayside, the idea has shifted. So I'm just trying to figure out what are the what are what are the what are the, the municipalities trying to solve with a shared investment, shared benefit, and it's hard. Like I think you know there was a maturity in the MRB that got to a point like the growth plan was a very big success for them. But now they said, okay, let's give us some harder problems. So we're doing things like ramp and, you know, as you know, shared investment, shared benefit. These are complex problems that uh, that take time to sort of link what you're doing tonight, right? It just it's having those frank conversations and getting all the information on, on the table. So I commend you for doing it because it's it's a hell of a challenge. And, and to commend our council, we have a number of us that are involved in all of those committees. So from our council to our admin to so yeah, it's, it's fun being out there, being part of the region, and, and taking an active leadership role in, yeah. in, in getting some of these conversations across the across the line. So, and and then that's what makes it work, right? Your personal engagement and your team's personal engagement and your ongoing participation in the regional conversation. That's the only way we get the trust, the transparency, and hopefully some kind of uh, outcome that we can all sort of look to and, and feel pretty pretty proud of. Any. Further questions or comments for Malcolm before we wrap this up for this evening? <laughs> you guys have done really well tonight. I gotta say, like, I mean, three and a half hours of slogging. <laughs> you guys are gonna say our last, our last couple of meetings have been less than an hour, so enjoy. We were due for wine, and this is it. So the tray's coming. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, does. But can I just get a quick motion from Council to accept the? The presentation from, from Mr. Bruce's information. We'll go from there. So moved. All in favor? That carries. And we're adjourned. Thank you very Thank much. You very Thanks. Much. Thanks. Well Thanks for sticking around. Oh, oh, like I said, I love watching democracy in action. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes participating in democracy. <laughs> See you Thursday afternoon. Correct. We was here. We got some local talent. We got uh, all food. It's going to be Canadian cuisine with an international flavor, but it's all Canadian product. We got Rig Hand coming up. Uh, we got some samples. <laughs>